appraiser try to get your property appraised. He still won't give me my ag exemption. <laughs> won't do it. Everybody ready? Good morning. We'll call to order the uh, March 8th, 2022 regular meeting of the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners. At this time, it's my pleasure to invite our Indian River County property appraiser, Mr. Wesley Davis, to the podium. He'll lead us in the invocation. That'll be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Moss. And we will begin with a moment of silent reflection for our first responders and members of the armed forces. Everyone, please rise. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come before you in this civilized society, even though at times it doesn't seem. In light of everything that's going on around the world, we thank you for the country that we live in. We thank you for the opportunities of the American dream that are in front of us right now. When tens of millions of people are in such pain and anguish, it's easy for us to make fun about prices at the pump which is a serious problem hurting many, many families. But we're thankful that that's all we have to complain about. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we're thankful for the leaders that are going to make decisions for this community that will affect it for generations to come. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, special thank you also to our uh, active military and veterans. I think we appreciate them more than we ever do um, at times like this. And given that it's International Women's Day, special salute to women in the military. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Wesley. Would like to uh, extend a welcome. We have the uh, Vero Beach uh, Mayor, Mr. Brackett, is here, and the Vero Beach uh, City Manager, Monty Falls. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, additions, deletions to the agenda. Uh, commissioners, I'd like to add two items in our presentations. One is a um, just a quick word about the STEAM uh, Fest coming up here this week and then a, uh, another recognition award I'd like to comment on. And are there any other changes, deletions to the agenda? Second. And the second was uh, Commissioner Moss, okay. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Our first presentation is a proclamation celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Older Americans Act Nutrition Program. That will be um, presented by Commissioner Moss, and we have Karen Deagle with the Senior Resource Association here. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Moss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to Karen Deagle and to Emily Snow. Uh, appreciate your being here today. I'll read the proclamation first. That's my understanding that you would like to do it that way, and then you'll be your opportunity to speak, and then I understand you have a video. That's correct. All right, wonderful. Proclamation celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Older Americans Act Nutrition Program. Whereas 50 years ago, on March 22, 1972, President Richard Nixon signed into law a measure that amended the Older Americans Act of 1965 to include a national nutrition program for seniors 60 years and older. And whereas this year, Meals on Wheels programs from across the country are joining together for the March for Meals awareness campaign to celebrate 50 years of success and garner the support needed to ensure these critical programs can continue to address food insecurity and malnutrition, combat social isolation, enable independence, and improve health for years to come. And whereas volunteers for Meals on Wheels programs in Indian River County are the backbone of the program, and they deliver not only nutritious meals to seniors and individuals with disabilities who are at significant risk of hunger and isolation, but also caring concern and attention to their welfare. 
And whereas Meals on Wheels programs in Indian River County deserve recognition for the heroic contributions and essential services they have provided to local communities, our state, and our nation amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and will continue to provide long after it is over. And whereas the senior population is increasing substantially, and action is needed now to support local Meals on Wheels programs through federal, state, and local funding, volunteering, donations, and raising awareness to ensure these vital services can continue to be delivered for another 50 years. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the Board recognizes March 2022 as a month celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Older Americans Act Nutrition Program and urges every community member to take this month to honor our Meals on Wheels programs, the seniors they serve, and the volunteers who care for them. Our recognition of and involvement in the national celebration can enrich our entire community and help combat senior hunger and isolation in America. Adopted this eighth day of March, 2022, and signed by all five county commissioners. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much for the proclamation. I'm Karen Deagle. I'm the CEO of the Senior Resource Association. And during the month of March, we joined thousands of Meals on Wheels programs across America, raising awareness about senior, senior hunger and isolation. Senior hunger and isolation are serious prob problems in our community. Food insecurity affects seniors differently. Even if a person has money to purchase food, they, not, they may, not be a, may not eat healthy or be able to shop for themselves and or prepare their meals. In 2021, Senior Resource Association provided 138,000 meals to seniors in Indian River County. Our homebound meal program helps alleviate hunger for older ad adults and hot nutritious meals is delivered by staff and volunteers to our clients five days each week and offers two frozen meals on the weekend. All meals are planned and evaluated by a registered dietitian to ensure they contain one third of the daily nutritional value. This program is more than delivering a meal. It's also a daily wellness check. Our visits provide seniors and their families a sense of security and save lives. Sadly, for many seniors, this is the only social interaction that they have on a daily basis. This daily feat of providing well over 450 meals each day could not be accomplished without the dedication, time, and effort of over 150 volunteers. However, please know that this, there is so, still so much to do. Right now, currently, there are um, over 168 seniors still on a waiting list waiting to receive a meal. The cost to feed a senior is $3,460 per year. On March 15th, 16th, and 17th, Senior Resource Association is hosting March for Meals again, which is a wonderful opportunity for public leaders and members of our community, like yourselves, to experience the gratification of delivering a meal to a homebound senior. I know many of you have already done it and hopefully you're going to join us again uh, this year to, to do that uh, champion for meals on one of those dates. Thank you again for the proclamation and I do have a short video that I would like to show you. very, very special guest with us uh, today. Um, I remember reading uh, Charlie Munger saying that uh, today. Um, I remember reading uh, Charlie Munger. Saying that he didn't know a smart man <laughs> who didn't read all the time. And he has yeah. characterized- I think we need to close that one and open the other one. The inspiration from there is how does one become a very effective learner? What is the science of learning? And uh... 
Hey, Brittany, this is Jim Gregg. I'm in slot four, and it's Route 4A. When the volunteer shows up, they have their route code right here, and then every day we give them a new pass key. Now we've got all the people that we have to deliver to. Meals on Wheels provides that hot meal each day. Meals on Wheels has been part of the Senior Resource Family of Services for 47 years. Okay. We can't do this program without our volunteers. It's funny, when you're driving with the actual meals, you start thinking about the people you're about to see and what they've been facing, who's in their family. By the time you get there, like, I know them, I'm glad to see them. This is an old friend. Thank you, we so appreciate it. <laughs> All right, I can tell he does. unprecedented time for all of us. COVID really brought to the attention the vulnerability of seniors. We experienced such a high volume of calls from people who needed food. At our peak, we were serving 16,000 meals a month. Not only am I concerned about continuing to feed everyone we are now, but also be able to start helping those that have asked for food. We are always looking for more volunteers. A volunteer gets to choose what days they want. Touching base and making sure people are safe is so important beyond me. I personally have had an incident where I went to the home and rang the bell, and the man yelled out, help me, help me. So if Meals on Wheels hadn't come, who knows how long he would have been there. <laughs> I have certainly developed friendships with my clients, and many of them are excited to see me. It's reassuring to have someone come by on a regular basis. You know what's going to happen on Monday morning. I'm going to show up with a meal for you. To see the smiles, to see the joy, and to know that they've got a fine quality meal coming to them. These meals on wheels are very essential for our community and for all our seniors. Meals on wheels certainly opened up both of our eyes that in this wealthy community, we have pockets of people that certainly need help. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> well, th Thank you very much for the important work that you do in the community. Thank you so much for uh, um, allowing me to uh, describe our March for Meals program or the Meals on Wheels program. And I certainly hope that I know a few of you signed up already um, for the program as I talk with my hands because I'm Canadian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. So thank you. Very good. Come on up, Karen. Squeezing down, okay. Gotta watch the, I, have... I think one more. Oh, wait, hold on, we have one more. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. And we'll get you back. Don't forget my bag. It's yes. the spatula. It's not the wooden spoon, as we talked about earlier. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, so, Commissioner, I wanted to briefly mention we have the Indian River Steam Fest coming up this Saturday, um, March 12th, at the IG Center from 10 to 4 p.m. This uh, STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. And it's sponsored by the uh, Vero Beach Academy, which is a local uh, homeschool co-op. And they're going to have all kinds of neat, innovative things. If you want to see what the next generation, what they're capable of, of doing, um, it, it's great to come out to this and see all the projects you're doing, their science projects. Um, I think this sounds really cool. There's going to be a drone zone, um, so you can learn how to do fly a drone, I guess. And then there's a mobile planetarium, which is an inflatable dome that gives students a, a tour through space. So that sounds pretty cool. 
So again, that's this Saturday, March 12th from 10 to 4 at the Intergenerational Building, and uh, looking forward to that. And then, Commissioners, uh, you all may not be aware, but um, last week the Indian River Chamber of Commerce had their annual awards uh, dinner and banquet, and um, I'm very proud uh, to say that the uh, Carolyn Eckert Economic Development Award went to our very own Jason Brown. So Jason, congratulations. Uh, uh, very well deserved and uh, having been a previous recipient of that, I, 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 it means a lot to me in my heart. I know it means a lot to you to be recognized uh, by the chamber for that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I know I, why you didn't tell me that this, what this other, other item was. So, um, um, yes, um, it feels a tremendous honor to earn the award named after Carolyn Eggert. When I first started here as a budget analyst, it was Mrs. Eggert uh, as, as a county commissioner, and she, uh, she uh, had earned, and earned that respect. Everybody called her Mrs. Eggert and was just a, just a giant in the community. Did wonderful things such as, you know, helping bring the Vera Beach Museum of Art to fruition as well as um, being a pioneer on economic development back at a time when it probably wasn't very popular here. Um, and so it's a tremendous honor. I do want to say that, you know, the, 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 the main uh, thing that was done that, that, uh, that, that earned that award, I guess, was the uh, Small Business Assistance Program for, with our CARES Act dollars for, through COVID. So I want to thank the commissioners as well as staff and our partners at the chamber as well as Indian River State College. So a lot of people, um, a lot of people, uh, had to uh, carry me on their shoulders in order for me to get that award, but uh, a lot of great work done, so thank you. And, and Jason, this may be worthy of the uh, Chairman's Wife Award, so there may be a key lime pie in your future. I'll, I'll see if Susan can't scare one up. Oh yeah, I, th I think definitely it should qualify for okay, that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, you know, you're all going to regret making me chair this year. You all know that, right? I, mean, just... I think we already do, but it's okay. <laughs> All right, there's no minutes, there's no informational items, fortunately. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda. Commissioners, anybody wish to pull anything for further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull 8F. 8F? You know, I had a problem with 8F, too, so I'm glad you're pulling that, yeah, uh, Commissioner. I, I think there's a lot of discussion needed. Yeah, that, that's going to need a lot of discussion. Um, I also would like to pull item 8D. So we have D and F. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to have another consent agenda item pulled for further discussion. Seeing none, commissioners? Chair move as amended. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Let me, um, Commissioner Adams, I'm going to go ahead and take item 8D first real quick and then we'll get to your poll. Um, Item 8D is just a, uh, it's a small uh, county outreach program we got a grant for. And just in the backup, um, there was a little confusion about what the, the grant was. In one instance, it said it was for $3.4 million. Then in the next paragraph, it said $1.1. So I just want to correct that. Uh, Rich, make sure I'm correct that we, we are going to get reimbursement of up to $3.4 million. Is that correct? That's correct. It was a typo in the finding error. The one, one, the first one million one hundred twenty-three thousand three hundred two should have read three million three hundred sixty-nine thousand nine hundred six, as is in the description. Okay, it was a typo right. on on my part. Okay, commissioners, I'm good to move this forward. Move approval. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor, signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries five zero. The next item that was pulled is item F and Commissioner Adams. Sure. Um, well, I honestly didn't have any questions on the actual item. I just wanted to welcome our new utilities director to the county and give him an opportunity um, to say hey and for us to say hey to him. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Um, my name is Sean Leesky. I am actually all the way from uh, cold Denver, Colorado. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited to be in warm Vero Beach, Florida. Um, moved in, actually arrived here last Thursday. Yesterday was my first day, so today is day two, and, and I think some people were actually shocked that I was back today. I'm not quite sure why that is, but I'm excited <laughs> to be here. Um, I'm excited to start work and really dive in and, and learn about the utility itself. I've been in utility work now myself for about 14 years um, in Colorado, 
and uh, been in water for about 20. So looking forward to, to understanding the issues that, that the utility here faces and taking it into the right, moving it in the right direction. So. Wonderful. Well, welcome aboard. We all look forward to working with you. I know there's a lot going on in utilities um, right now, and we have a lot of projects. So you're probably hitting the ground running. So Absolutely. Welcome. And Sean, you may think it's nice now being here in warm, sunny Vero Beach, but we'll, we'll check back with you in August and well, see how you feel then, okay? <laughs> I've heard that. I'll, I'll yeah. help to figure that out. As yeah, the, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll circle back with you and we'll check. But uh, welcome aboard and uh, glad to have you here. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Adams, would you like to approve your agenda item? Yes, I'm sorry. Move approval. Thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor, signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. There are no public items, so we will move to the county administrator matters. Uh, the one item is the environmental land bond referendum. Mr. Brown. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> As you know, back in early 2020, um, the Indian River Land Trust or reached out to us about uh, possibly exploring the potential to uh, issue uh, up to $50 million in environmental land bonds. Um, we all know what happened in, in 2020. After that, they requested that we withdraw that due to the potential impacts of COVID. Um, earlier this year, uh, the group did come back with the results of the, um, of the uh, study. Um, the feasibility study that had been done and at the meeting um, the board uh, recommended on February 1st that the uh, that the staff uh, move forward with bringing back a land acquisition bond uh, referendum to the board on vote four to one um, so here we are today since since that time yes Commissioner Flesher dissenting um, so since that meeting staff has worked with the supporters of of the referendum as well as some of our outside experts, including our financial advisor and our bond council to craft um, ballot language that, uh, that uh, both I believe we and the, uh, and the supporting group uh, uh, fully support that language, which is before you there. Um, also uh, the resolution, the, board, the staff recommends that the board consider the resolution. Um, we are in agreement on everything. There are some differences regarding some of the potential um, initial improvement expenses. So of course the land bonds uh, could be used for the acquisition of property uh, and trying to find my the right paperwork here, sorry. Um, the, there is a, uh, a slight difference regarding um, the language that says to construct public access improvements such as parking facilities, restroom facilities, trails, and other such infrastructure in connection therewith, together with the necessary preservation, restoration, remediation, and reclamation activities to preserve, protect, or enhance such property or restore such property to its natural site, um, natural state. So um, staff would recommend that we uh, are authorized to use those dollars for the initial improvements. Um, of course, uh, ongoing maintenance and operation will not be funded from the bonds. They would not be able to be funded with the bonds and staff would not recommend that. Um, regardless, uh, the other item is um, both staff and the, uh, the, the supporting group agreed that the Land Acquisition Advisory Committee in its state at the time with uh, 18 or more members uh, over various years um, might not be the best uh, avenue for kind of vetting the properties um, that the lack was 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 tasked with that however um, I believe maybe a smaller committee or perhaps a working group with with staff and some of the uh, some of the uh, experts to make sure that we have a process because I want to make sure that we have a good process that we can tell the public about as far as uh, as far as developing the list and the priorities of the properties that we would acquire with these dollars um, so with that, um, I do want to mention that, that one thing that, uh, that we have learned over time, we've had two prior bond authorizations, first in 92 and the second in 2004. Um, I believe that we, um, probably didn't have our eyes fully wide open on some of the ongoing responsibilities, the initial improvements. So I think it's very important that we do fund the initial improvements from the, from the bond proceeds. Um, as, as stated in the staff memo, um, we have $13.8 million in initial improvements in our five-year capital improvements program. 
many of these improvements are initial improvements, if you will, for properties we purchased 15 uh, years ago or more in some cases. So um, staff recommends that we <laughs> do make sure that we set aside a, a portion of the dollars. You know, my example would be if we're going to buy a piece of property for $5 million, if we estimate it'll be a million dollars for the initial improvements, we kind of set those dollars aside for that for that purpose. We can, of course, uh, seek grants to help out with those dollars, and, and we will do that as well. Um, but just want to make sure that we are um, prepared to do the, the management plans. The management plans we have in place are obligations of ours due to the fact that we did get matching dollars from Florida Communities Trust to buy many of these properties and um, with those have management plans that we're required to do lots of the many of the things that we're doing. Um, and then just also to uh, make sure that everyone's aware that we do need to manage those lands. We've got over 2,200 acres under county management right now in addition to other other uh, properties that might be under various state or federal agencies uh, for for management. Uh, right now we have a staff of four. Um, as we continue to do these access improvements, we will need to, to beef that up on the lands we've already purchased, and we just need to be aware that there will be a, an ongoing maintenance responsibility that is not funded by these bonds um, that, that we will need to commit to. So with that, um, staff recommends that the board approve the proposed resolution authorizing the referendum and take any other necessary actions to have the matter placed on the november 8 2022 ballot um, also direct staff to update the environmental lands program guide uh, prior to the referendum and then provide direction to staff on the process to prioritize um, properties for purchase with the land bond dollars so with that i'll stop talking and if you have any questions i'm happy to answer them thank you jason commissioners any questions of staff commissioner flesher Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I, I truly appreciate uh, the, the thought process of uh, uh, requesting a, a maintenance or a improvement process. We are set back probably about $14 million over the next five years for unimprovement, the, the improvements that we earmarked from a previous bond. And uh, much of that work has not been done. Is it that fair? We, we have accomplished a significant amount over the last few years, but we have that, that $13.8 million is, is still on the, on the plate for us to do. Yes. Still on the plate. And uh, so earmarking this, this funding uh, is, uh, and again, I understand that we can't do it for maintenance, but we can do it for initial improvements. So it could not be put in a five-year plan. It would have to be done initial maintenance. Would that be safe to assume? I think ideally we would we would take on these improvements as soon as we could after the after the purchase. Now it may take time to get permits and design to work to be done. We will also you know go after grants and see if we can get those. So it may take a couple of years, but we certainly want to do that more quickly than than we had in the past. And there are a lot of I'm not blaming anyone in the past. There are a lot of things that happened when just when we were starting to do those things, we had the Great Recession and all those types of things. But uh, just want to make sure that we have uh, a good plan so we can go execute those things which we're, we're supposed to be doing soon after the purchase. Yes. Well, it's comforting, but my reservations have not uh, changed in any way, shape, or form due to the current financial conditions, uh, the economy in which we're riding right now, and I believe that uh, we uh, are in a bracing mode, and uh, I don't know how much money could be earmarked towards the initial improvements when real estate is probably at its, it is at its highest point it has been in the history of the United States. I don't think that this is the time to be purchasing conservation land, although I am a strong believer in conservation. This may be another time to say, let's pause and wait, and uh, let's look at um, COVID was a, a primary reason for delaying this, and uh, the same thing happened with uh, uh, the Children's Trust, and then finances also uh, were proposed as and indicated that the Children's Trust had to be withdrawn as well as what this is too. And I believe that we would be greater stewards of the taxpayer dollar and the taxpayer's commitment if we did not 
go forward with this at this time. That's not to say that it's not worthy. That's not to say that it's not important. And it's not to say that this is the uh, more um, the proper way to look at the future for our lands, our beautiful county, and to ensure that we have the proper amount of conservation lands. But a large percentage of our county is conservation lands. And now we're looking at housing. And in looking at housing, well, you can't build on conservation land. And uh, I, I understand that that's the purpose for it. But there's nobody jumping in leaps and bounds trying to build on these uh, <coughs> lands right now. So I, I think it's a valiant effort, but I don't believe that it's appropriate, fair to the taxpayer to commit them for the next 20 years for uh, a, um, a commitment, a financial commitment, when people are figuring out how far they can drive because the gas is over $4 a gallon and what they can do and what they can find in the grocery <coughs> store if it's there and looking on the stock exchange to see if toilet paper and paper towels are going to be available, I think it's probably more prudent to put dollars, put tax dollars into what we need to do where the rubber hits the road, the employees and the people who make the difference and provide the service for the health, safety and welfare of the citizens of Indian River County and not for the uh, conservation land. Again, it's very appropriate uh, as far as under normal conditions, but I believe that it is very errant on us to move forward with a commitment, even if it's just to give it to the taxpayer, to the voter, to decide whether we go forward or not. I believe that uh, it, it's a, a big ask. Thank you. Commissioner Airman, any comments? I do. Thank you. Questions, Mr. suggestions? Uh, Commissioner Flusher, I, I hear you loud and clear. I don't know if the time's ever good to to, to, to spend money uh, anymore right now, but I think we'd be missing the boat if we don't have the opportunity to buy conservation lands that, that, that come available to us or uh, land or, or something that we need to improve the quality of the lagoon at this time or other, or other things. What's nice about this is I think some people are misunderstanding this, that if this passes that we take $50 million on right away, uh, what the luxury of this is, we don't have to spend any of it. We have 20 years to spend it. We can spend it any time we want or any time the opportunity comes. So maybe, you know, not having 50 million, you know, right off the get-go uh, and the taxpayer hadn't paid for it might be a relief if nothing comes available in the first year after after the bond the commitment is there right the commitment is there over so over, over a 20 year period i think the payment. economy will recover eventually but uh, but I, I don't i don't necessarily disagree with you but i just don't think we can we can uh, afford to miss this opportunity with regards to this and and uh, uh, so it's it's just very important to me that, that we that we have this availability and have the money to do it with the opportunity knocks at, knocks at the door that, that uh, of things that we need to do. The only question that I have is again is about the. Um, uh, I support the referendum, but the, the transparency of how we're going to select the lands that 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 we that we want. Um, I understand that the previous committee had like 18 members and. That's way too many <laughs> for me. You can't, I don't see how anybody would come into a resolution with, with 18 members of a committee. But, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I, I'm thinking that we, I would like to say we move ahead and we give maybe staff direction and the land trust some direction to come up with some uh, ideas for this. I, I would personally like to see something like, uh, you know, each commissioner have a pick, maybe two at large and a representative from the land trust be involved. But I'm open. I'm open for suggestions from my fellow commissioners or even staff or the land trust on how they want to do this. But I don't want to overkill this thing and have a have a ton of people making decisions. I think uh, I think we get you know seven smart people in there that that are aware of this and understand the importance of what we're trying to do. I think we can we can uh, identify the lands we need. But I don't think staff should be doing it. I don't think the land trust themselves should be doing it. I think it needs to be a, you know, a, a transparency thing with, with the, the group making a decision and bring it back to this board to identify what we need to do and what we need to purchase. But 
you know, in the previous meetings, I, I've said how much I support this and how much I'm in favor of this. And I, I, again, if, if we miss this opportunity, I think it would, I think it would, uh, I think it would be detrimental to our to environment, our conservation, our lagoon, and things that we have here in any River County. So, uh, again, I, I fully support this and. That's about the only question I have is just on the makeup and the transparency of um, how we're going to choose the lands. Yep. And uh, Commissioner Ehrman, just a, a slight correction, and Jason can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we issue the bonds, we, we have 20 years to pay them off. Right. But usually uh, when you go out for a municipal bond issue, um, the, uh, the, the underwriters and the, the, you know, the money people that work all this, they generally want you to... Uh, have a plan to expend those funds within the first three years or so. Now, Jason, is that a lock hard rule or just kind of a, we want to be showing progress and doing things, not just sitting on the money in a bank account? Is that So in order to issue tax exempt municipal bonds, we have to certify that we have a plan to spend the bond proceeds within three years. Um, there's no bond police that are going to come and arrest us if it takes us four years. Um, however, we have to have a reasonable amount. I think what Commissioner Ehrman may have been referring to is we have the potential to split this up into two different issues, which I think we would like to do. Um, that second bond issue might have some land purchases in it. It m would also have some of the, um, the initial improvements, because if you think about it, even if we went forward with a, and bought a bunch of property, we need to go and do design, uh, you know, with the management plan bid those out, get permits, try to receive grants. So we wouldn't likely be able to do all of that within three years. So um, what we <clears throat> would likely do is break that into two smaller bond issues. We did that with the 92 issue. It was a $26 million authorization. We did 11 million and 15 million there. So we could do 25 million first and buy, the, buy, buy some of the initial lands and then a couple of years later do the second amount. So I think maybe what Commissioner Ehrman was alluding to is we might not have that entire millage right out of the gate if we do just do a smaller issue. So, and, and I neglected to talk about the, the, the projected millage for the entire 50 million is 0.175 mills, which works out on a typical house with a $250,000 taxable value. Um, which is getting harder to find, um, but uh, that, that's about a $43 annual tax impact for those folks. But if we did a $25 million issue, it would be half of that, so we wouldn't be hitting with the taxpayers with that entire amount up front. Mr. Chairman, that's exactly what I meant. This I, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's exactly what I meant, is that we don't have $50 million, bam, like on the 24th, on the, on the November 9th, we don't have $50 million right. in, the, in the bank account right away, and we're paying you know, everybody's paying on that. It, 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 it works out over a period of time. And hopefully by that time, the economy will be in better shape. That's a lot Mr. of Adams, hope. any comments? That's a lot of hope. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a couple. Um, one, in relation to the LAC committee or whatever mm -hmm. we're gonna call the, the new committee, um, I, Commissioner Ehrman, served on that committee and uh, when I was with the city of Felsmer and I can tell you while it was very interesting to take field trips to random far removed lands with Roland and um, multiple other people in the community, Roland was always a great um, field guide, but um, it was very unwieldy and it became very territorial as far as who, you know, who are we buying enough property in North County? Are we? paying enough attention to South County and my priority is the lagoon and my priority is the marsh and it just became more of um, more political I guess than it needed to be and I think the focus should be on what properties and what is what is the goal of the bonds and what properties are going to help us get to that goal um, so you know, I don't, I would prefer to see a more collaborative process between um, the stakeholders and the county. I don't necessarily think we need official commissioner appointments. Um, I think that's where we kind of get into having people there that aren't necessarily focused on what the task at hand would be. I would propose we let staff work with um, the stakeholders that have already been working on this 
and let them come back with some kind of prioritization. There's already basically a tentative proposed list that we have had in these discussions coming up with the bonds. Um, so really for me, it's more of a matter of prioritizing those properties and evaluating which ones might be available. I think um, for us as commissioners, it's more important to kind of look at the ranking criteria in that guide to provide staff with staff in the working group with some kind of direction um, on what we want to prioritize. You know, for instance, I'm thinking what other properties might attach to properties we already have. Where do we need to expand um, conservation? Where do we have opportunities to provide new conservation? I know um, wildlife corridors have been a big discussion point. Um, we've done a lot in the more urbanized area. So I know there's been some, some thought and discussion on trying to pr protect the water on our western borders and providing some land opportunities there. So I, that's my input on that. Of course, um, you know, whatever the commission wants, but I tend to n not want to hamstring the process with creating a ginormous formal committee that then there's other implications there. I think transparency is when it comes back to us and we have the discussion on what is proposed and how we move forward in that. Um, and then I have a, I have a question, um, I think Beth, Beth is here, um, and I just kind of wanted to get some input. You know, Roland is not here anymore, but you're doing a lot with the con lands that have been purchased in, with the past bonds. So I was just curious on what your experience was with what needs to be done to provide access and also to protect the environmental importance of the lands that have already been acquired. And then the second part is kind of separately from that, what has been your experience with the ongoing maintenance that's required to keep them in a state where they're pristine and, and doing what we need them to do? Good morning, Commissioners. Beth Powell, Assistant Director of Parks and Conservation Resources. As many of you know, um, my position was created in the midst um, of the bond referendum issuance. Um, so I've been with the county for 22 years. I was one person, kind of like Paul Tritech was at Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge. The joke was always one person, one man, one gun, uh, protecting Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge. And so for any River County, I've had the pleasure uh, of being able to manage uh, Indian River County's conservation lands, um, not only um, after they were acquired, you know, after I had um, joined the county, but um, through acquisition phase. And um, thank goodness for Roland and community development because they took that uh, lead uh, before my position in conservation lands program was even really a thing. There was an acquisition program that was very active, but we hadn't even entered into the management phase. And I believe my position was created in large part due to the fact that we had obligations through Florida Communities Trust for some of our properties that had been purchased and funded as far back as 1995. Wabasa well, Scrub, I believe, is one of our oldest, along with Oslo Riverfront Conservation Area, which was funded prior to the environmental bond referendum. Um, so that being said, uh, we did, uh, you know, have great anticipation of doing public use improvements right away after the properties were purchased. And our first uh, two bond referendums did allow for uh, the, um, the initial improvements. However, what we found ourselves in uh, in 2006, 2008 was the um, Great Recession or uh, the economic decline, whatever you want to call it. But uh, in effect, uh, we were uh, not only pulling staff, um, people were being uh, not, positions were not being filled, our budgets were significantly cut. Uh, and so for those years, it's not that we didn't do anything. I actually worked very hard uh, on many of our conservation areas, particularly those that were uh, linked to our Scrub J Habitat Conservation uh, Program. And we did a lot of work with Florida Forest Service, Florida Division of Forestry, uh, as well as uh, some contract work uh, throughout those years. Because we simply didn't have the funding, uh, the budget, or the personnel to do public access improvements, we made what improvements that we could in-house. Uh, I'd like to say that almost every conservation area is open to the public, even though it may not have public access. So if you live uh, in a community that's adjacent to a conservation area, we made every effort to get those conservation areas open to the public with trails, even if that meant hand-cut uh, hand trails, working with volunteers, et cetera. 
uh, some of our uh, first conservation areas to experience public use improvements prior to 2006-2008 uh, included Oslo Riverfront Conservation Area, Captain Forrester Hammock Preserve, Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge. You know, all of those were in full swing uh, and were being uh, developed. Then we worked during the recession uh, on North Sebastian Conservation Area because we had basically a makeshift parking lot that was associated with the property. And so we did a lot of that in-house. That being said, those are the improvements uh, that you can do in-house. And you're very limited on what you can do uh, with bodies and chainsaws and a tractor. You need heavy equipment. You have to have design and engineering associated with those projects. You have to account for every development uh, process that is accompanied with uh, a, a major site plan. Halstrom Farmstead is a great example. It's gone through a major site plan approval uh, and everything that a developer would have to go through, we have to go through that same process. It takes engineering plans, it takes design, uh, it takes permits from St. John's River Water Management District, sometimes DEP, it depends on uh, the Army Corps even. So these are not small scale um, operations that we're in the midst of right now. And I do want to emphasize that because my goal um, has been to this point and in the last couple of years to get these sites open to the public to provide amenities and access to everyone, as many people as we can get because it's their land, it's our land as a community and we want to encourage visitors and residents to be getting the most out of those properties. So we are smack dab in the middle of that right now. I think we have a total of five ongoing projects right now that are either in, co in construction or um, will be soon uh, initiating, uh, initiating contracts for construction. That being said, it's a heavy load right now uh, with that in place. So I just want to emphasize that. The other thing to consider, we don't know what properties would rank high at this point in time. You need technical expertise to be able to evaluate the land. If the goal of the environmental land uh, bond is to protect and preserve all of the things that we mentioned, water quality, water resources, et cetera, habitat, wildlife quarters, you have to have technical backing to be able to rank um, and provide a, the board a good criteria and a listing because it'll be hard. There'll be many properties and there's a limited amount of funds. $50 million is not gonna go very far right now. It's just the simple fact of the matter. So um, the, the LAC uh, Land Acquisition Advisory Committee and then subsequent to that was the Conservation Lands Advisory Committee um, was valuable in many different ways. But I think that going forward, having the technical expertise from folks who specialize in water quality, uh, wildlife management, et cetera, would be valuable to be able to rank those because you're gonna have these coming in hot and heavy and you've gotta be able to you know, provide some kind of meaningful criteria for why one ranks higher than another. And it's the board's direction and uh, whether or not uh, we focus on regions or whether we focus on areas, there's a lot that has to be hashed out. It's a huge undertaking. Um, and unfortunately, unless Roland comes back, <laughs> you know, we're kind of on our own. Not to say that I haven't sit, you know, been there and watched the whole process, I have. Uh, we have many members of our community who have watched the process so they know what's involved with that <coughs> as, as well as community development. But I think that uh, taking a look, uh, you know, a hard look on how you're going to rank those is probably one of the most important things that has to be done. Otherwise, we might as well throw spaghetti to the wall and just pick off strings and use the money up. There's additionally, um, I, I talked to Dwayne DeFries with the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program uh, yesterday. He did mention, and I apologize, I didn't have time to look into it further, that St. John's River Water Management District is looking to do some significant acquisitions to do some uh, water quality uh, protection measures. And that may be um, something that we would want to look into and find out if there's any uh, amount of the environmental bond funds that would be utilized to further their projects which would lessen the burden on the county in terms of management and also extend the projects that they're already working on, um, which is significant for water quality. I would like to also point out uh, to uh, the, the voters and, and to everyone here that our GIS department did an amazing job creating um, an application to where you can go uh, online and you can actually see how much uh, land and the use. I, I know we did a presentation, I think Paige did a presentation a while back. But I'd like to point out that conservation, we have 150 square miles, which is 27.9% currently in conservation. 
We have 13.2 square miles or 2.45% in open space. And water, we have 36.86 square miles, which is 6.83%. That means we have 37, over 37% of our uh, county is currently in conservation. A large part of that is not under county management. That's actually under the district or federal uh, management. So um, I just think that it's important to get a big picture of where, um, where our county lies. And uh, the GIS did a great job of putting uh, that land use summary together, I think, for us. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Mr. Adams, you? Um, no, I think, but I think that you made a couple of really important comments that we might want to consider as, as a board. One, that technical assistance or that technical discussion um, or person on whatever committee is created or whatever working group, I prefer to call it a working group versus a committee, but um, is going to be very important. And I also think we need to think about the acquisition portion of it as well because somebody is going to have to, if this passes, work with property owners um, and try to come up with those types of deals. And, and I you know, community development has a, has a ton going on right now, and that's something we need to think about. I don't know, I guess this might be more of a process question, um, but do we have to decide today the criteria and a committee makeup, or can we just decide on putting this out to the voters and the resolution and ballot language, and then maybe have some further discussions to kind of put those criteria in place, because I do agree that it's probably something we need to take a little bit more time to make sure we're getting that process and parameter down properly instead of just throwing something out there and, and hoping it works, because having gone through the process last time, my concern is that it, it kind of exactly what Beth said, it becomes more of a pet project situation versus marking off and meeting goals that we have set. Yes, yeah, so we don't have to decide the finer points of how that works today. We, the, the board can approve the resolution and then give staff direction to bring back you know, various options to, to, to do that. I just want to, I wanted to raise the issue today that we want to make sure we have a good, robust process um, and wanted to, you know, any direction that you guys are providing already so far is, is good, and then we can bring that back for a, for a final decision from the board at a, at a later meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate that history. Uh, yeah, Beth, just <clears throat> one of, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Captain Forrester because <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to be, have in here is that we would put in the initial public access facilities. And I think Captain Forrester is kind of exactly what I'm thinking. So we've got a, a dirt parking area, a restroom, uh, I think there's a kiosk there, and then the trails. So that, that's what I envision as um, with some of the bond money, those are the kind of things I want to see go in early on um, so the public can go there and, and access those lands. So I just want to thank you for mentioning Captain Forrester because that's kind of exactly what I'm envisioning. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Moss, any comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this referendum comes not a moment too soon. We all know we have huge numbers of people coming to us. Uh, we're a very attractive county, and I think one of the primary reasons we are so is our open space. We enjoy it. They enjoy it. And this is not just a matter of my opinion. Uh, this has also come up in the visioning workshops. And for those who have not had uh, the opportunity to participate, this information is available on the county website, ircgov.com. The thing that ra ranked the highest was preserving environmentally sensitive land. The highest value uh, was placed on that. So we know that, and we need to honor that, um, in my opinion. On top of that, uh, recently uh, the county attorney uh, conducted a workshop for CDD and the room was packed with, guess what, out of town developers. So we, I think we need to move on this and we probably should have moved on it even a year ago, but COVID uh, prevented us from doing so and, and, and rightly so at that time. Um, specifically, 
I'd like to address uh, in section 13, um, I'm in agreement, and I think all of the commissioners received this email. I'm referring to the email from uh, Ken Grudens, David Cox, Dan Lansom, and uh, George Glenn Jr., which is dated March 5th, uh, 2022 Land Conservation Bond, section 13. I would like to see uh, the language uh, that was stricken in that, cop in that email stricken from this. I don't think the resolution matches the referendum. Fine with the referendum language, but the resolution uh, in effect or operationally adds to uh, what you see in the referendum, and I'll refer to that language specifically, the stricken language. Uh, the necessary preservation, restoration, remediation, and reclamation activities to preserve, protect, or enhance such property or restore such property to its natural state, including um, that language uh, opens the door to spending large sums of money not on, on raw land. And we know we're not, I, I, and I appreciate Ms. Mitchell and what she had to say about Hallstrom House and all that kind of thing, but we're not doing that anymore. Uh, my understanding is that buying historic properties resulted in, in all kinds of um, unforeseen situations. Uh, so we're not, historic properties are, are not involved. In, in this referendum. I, I'd like to see the, the focus on raw land. Um, I would uh, suggest, and it's been brought up by a number of the other uh, commissioners, that with the stricken language, you might want to insert uh, just two words, initial re remediation. If you want to do something initially, uh, that's a, that would be fine. But that would be uh, my take on it. That's what I would suggest uh, that we would consider as it has been proposed. Um, in addition to that, with regard to uh, having a committee, um, yeah, I, I definitely see the point in that, that there were too many people. Uh, that was uh, far too many. Uh, I, I think I agree with uh, uh, Commissioner Ehrman. I would like to see a committee of uh, perhaps seven people, and that would be an appointee by each of us, by county commissioners, and uh, two people operating at large. I understand uh, that we need expertise. Um, I think we can find that. I think that there's enough enthusiasm for this uh, referendum and, and the projects that will proceed from it that we will have volunteers, um, you know, with expertise. I just, you know, I'm, I'm out in the community enough. I'll, 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 I'll find them. I'll track them down wherever they live. But I, 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 have, I have every hope that we should, we just need, we need to go forward with this. Uh, yes, you can, you can pick it apart, you can be negative, we can naysay about any, any, any single part of it, but this is so important. This is our open land. This is, this is what we all enjoy uh, about this, this county. It's, it's beautiful, and, we, and we, we need to preserve that, and we see people coming in, and we need to act now. And I hope that the commissioners will consider uh, the stricken language that was suggested to us. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up, Commissioner? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on something Commissioner Moss said. Um, again, if we have a committee that is comprised mainly of commissioner appointees, we lose the technical assistance aspect that everybody has identified even the groups that are putting this together are bringing it forward as being very important. The people in the community that you are speaking of that will volunteer are the same, most likely, group of people that were on the LAT committee last time. And while there was some expertise there, and they were all lovely people that are very committed to our community, what you had was technical opinions and not technical assistance. And I think what we're trying to do with this bond is to raise the caliber of input to something that is less opinion oriented and more um, purely from a, how are we going to accomplish our goals of water quality and habitat restoration or habitat protection. And um, most of the members of the public do not have that background. They um, might serve on certain other uh, 
agency boards and things of that nature. But when you're talking about technical background and being able to fully vet and assess the importance of properties one over the other, most of our appointees are going to be giving opinions versus technical knowledge. And the last thing, just to kind of address something else you said, I, I want to make this very clear to the public and to my fellow commissioners that my goal in having these discussions and bringing this issue forward originally was not intended as a tool to prevent development by any stretch of the imagination. It is a tool to protect our future water quality and habitat areas. So I think we need to be very careful in how we uh, talk about this because what you're saying makes it sound like we want to spend $50 million to prevent people from coming here, and that's just not the case. No, we don't need to spend money to prevent people from coming here. Are, are you thinking then that we would not have a committee, that we would decide ourselves, uh, the commission? Is, is, that, is that what you're thinking? I mean, operationally? How, how would you want to handle it? No, I envision a working group made up of um, staff, made up of, the, of some of the community partners that have brought this forward, and made up of um, those technical folks. For instance, perhaps somebody from forestry or somebody from um, UF IFAS, somebody from the Lagoon Council, somebody possibly from St. John's that has some knowledge and background on really how to evaluate property. Um, I think some of our groups that are working wonderfully in the community to conserve and advocate for conservation um, are, are great and would be a lovely voice on the committee, but I really want to make sure that there is some kind of technical element that is not opinion-based, but is more technical-based, and I see this more as an ad hoc working group than an official committee like a, an economic development committee or an ag advisory committee or a land acquisition committee, something that is more um, staff-based and that then they have the freedom to really have conversations. Um, they can talk, they can flesh things out, they can bring people in to help, and then what they come up with is brought back to us for a public discussion and um, a vetting on, on our part. I think that creating just a standing committee is where you really get into the unwieldiness and the inability to have those technical discussions that need to happen. Because the other thing you have to figure out is, again, what is St. John's already doing when they're looking at land purchases? What is, you know, um, the University of Florida just did a large purchase across our border and now they're looking at purchases in our western land. We should not be going after projects um, that they are already going after. We should be looking at what they're doing, getting input from them, and then figuring out how we can either help them, how we can accentuate what they're already doing, and how we can partner and not overlap so we're stretching dollars, and if this is something we're going to do, we're getting the most bang for our buck versus competing with St. John's to purchase the same property, or competing with St. John's or University of Florida to meet the same goal. If their goal is, ha is wildlife corridors, then I don't need to play in that area, in that area of the county. Maybe I'm next door to that trying to make that wildlife corridor larger. If they're trying to protect, you know, Blue Cypress Lake, I don't need to be competing with St. John's to do that, but I can look maybe to the south at, um, you know, some of the feeder springs that are going into, into uh, the Blue Cypress area or to the north and some of those other marshes and ranch lands that feed into that. So we are making what they're doing larger and more impactful with what little bit that we have. I think, I think you make a good point and, and I agree with it. I, I think there probably should be a committee, but it should be experts, um, as you're saying. I'm just uh, trying to envision how that would happen. Would you see people applying? In other words, we set a number. Uh, we, set, we say there are Mr. seven people Moss, on I think the we're spending a lot of time on something we don't need to talk about today. Well, I guess we're going to give direction to the staff on this. Oh, uh, we can tell them to come back with some options. But I think we want to focus on <clears throat> approving the resolution and approving the fact it's going to go on the 
November ballot. And then we'll have a lot more time to discuss the, uh, the fine points of how that advisory committee is going to be made up. I think we're, we just need to move on from that for right now. So sure. um, I'm in full agreement with Vice Chairman Ehrman. I think we new, need to move forward with this. Um, I appreciate Commissioner Flesher's concerns about the situation, but, um, y you know, I if you wait for the perfect time, you'll never get anything done because uh, there never is a perfect time. Um, if this is approved in November, the, um, the bonds won't be issued till 23, so it won't even be until the 23 trim notice comes out that this will be on there, and that's a, a year and a half away, and, you know, I just don't think we can sit here and not move forward hoping that, you know, two years from now we, we, it's a perfect condition. So I'm, I'm very supportive of moving forward with this. And one of the things that scares me is um, you never know what the Florida legislature is going to do. And this year there was a bill introduced to create seagrass mitigation banks. And the only reason why you need a seagrass, seagrass mitigation bank is so that a developer can then offset impacts by filling seagrasses in the lagoon. And this bill had traction. I, I think it finally got uh, changed around. But those are the things that can come out of the legislature every year. Um, and I think we need to be able to preserve our very environmentally significant lands, get them in our ownership, and protect them from whatever a future legislature might try to do to us. But I just don't think they care about our our community, our environment, like we do. So I'm all in favor of, of moving this forward and putting it on the ballot. Um, I had a, a, a long, uh, very productive meeting with Mr. Glenn yesterday um, talking about the, uh, the, the wording in Section 13. And commissioners, I put on the, the dais this morning um, my suggestion after my discussions with Mr. Um, uh, Glenn and just to put it out so the whole public hears it, I inserted the word initial, just to, and, and let me just back up a little bit. Um, their concern is, and, and their priority is they want to, as much funds available for preservation and acquisition as possible, and I get that. Um, and then trying to balance it with what I believe and I think staff supports is um, we need to be able to do some of these initial uh, public access improvements and, and some initial uh, uh, preservation and restoration of the land so that it's a it's a good project from the get-go and not 10 or 15 years later so trying to find that initial um, or not initial the uh, common ground um, so I, I, I inserted the word initial um, so that it's clearly not going to be ongoing maintenance it's going to be the the first thing we do to get it initially done and improved I um, struck out the words remediation and reclamation and struck the word enhance and struck the restore such property to a natural state um, and i could see where those were fairly broad um, you know restoring property to a natural state that could be buying a uh, an old citrus grove and spending millions you know to, to make it a, another wetland or something so I, I understand your concern on that wording. So how it reads, and, and you all have a copy of this, but just for the public, um, beginning with, together with the necessary initial preservation and restoration activities to preserve and protect such property, e.g. exotic removal, restoration of natural water flows. And so I think, in my mind, that kind of narrows the scope of what we want to do up front. Um, it still allows us to do some of those initial um, things like removing exotics and such, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it, it does limit the use of those funds so that the, um, the supporters of this um, will feel comfortable moving forward with the wording. Um, and so I, I put that out there for y'all's um, information as well. Um, if there's no other comments from the commissioners, I'll go ahead and open this up to the public. Um, is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on the uh, land uh, bond referendum? Good morning. Welcome, George. Good 
Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I had some prepared. Just your name and address, please. Uh, George Glenn Jr. And I'm a part of the working group uh, consisting of uh, Ken Grudens, Dan Lampson, David Cox, and myself. Um, I do want to list every environmental organization that's supporting this effort because I think it's important to realize how universally uh, supportive and important this is to the environmental community. Uh, we are looking at the Indian River Land Trust, the Indian River Neighborhood Association, the Pelican Island Audubon Society, the Clean Water Coalition of Indian River County, Friends of St. Sebastian River, Ocean Research and Conservation Association, the Environmental Learning Center, and the Pelican Island, Auto uh, Pel Pelican Island Conservation Society. So this is, uh, I do want to clarify maybe something that's uh, not quite accurate. This is not a uh, Indian River Land Trust effort. In fact, out of our four person working group, there's only one person who's associated with the Land Trust. Uh, the other three of our members are not associated with the Land Trust. So this is a, an effort by um, representatives from many of these organizations bringing this forward. I had prepared remarks, but I think if I were to read those, I would just waste your time because you all have had some really thoughtful discussions. But I would like to address some of the things that have come up. Um, you know, I, I've sort of heard, uh, well, the uh, property values are so high uh, right now, it'd be a terrible idea to go and issue a bond to preserve land. Uh, but the reason why property values are high is because the economy is red hot. Um, and I also feel like more often than not, when I hear people say, well, you know, the economy's too hot, the land prices are too high, we shouldn't purchase, that if we were sort of in the opposite situation, if property values were lower, you know, because maybe the economy wasn't doing so well, we would hear, well, we can't go purchase land because the economy isn't doing so well. And so I think I agree with what Commissioner Airman and Commissioner O'Brien have said, is that if you start trying to pick the perfect spot, you're never going to find that middle, you know, the porridge isn't too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. And so... Um, I also want to uh, bring up something about housing, that you know, housing is record highs, and they are. But it's not because of conservation land, and it's certainly not going to be impacted by preserving some land. Just in the last two weeks, we read in the press journal that the uh, western half of the Corgan Ranch, uh, over 5,000 acres, was put up for sale. And just on that portion of uh, what constitutes probably one fourth of what um, the city of Felsmer has capacity to develop on uh, has the potential for 9,000 housing units. And uh, when you look at all the properties that are out there that we are not going to be able to preserve, uh, certainly preserving a little bit of land is not going to impact uh, the properties to deprive us of, of housing allotment. And the third uh, thing I wanted also to bring up is uh, the millage rate. I believe that the last millage uh, that applied to the final bond payment was at about 0.26 mills. And uh, we are forecasting, I think conservatively, uh, that the millage rate would be about 0.175. So we're looking at a 32% reduction in what people would be paying for on, their, uh, on the millage rate uh, to preserve land. Uh, I did hear a number that sort of startled me a little bit, and that was uh, for every $5 million we used to preserve land, $1 million would go to uh, improvements. If, if my quick math works out correctly, that's almost $9 million being allocated to non-land conservation uses. That's certainly much higher than we feel comfortable with. Uh, you know, we thought a cap might be about 10% and, and maybe something lower than that. I, I, want to also talk about a little bit uh, of, of this idea that maybe we did things improperly earlier because we didn't set enough money aside from the bonds to do these improvements. And I've heard a number of uh, 13.4 million is what we're now spending for some of these improvements. But what I would flip that around a little bit is to say, well, if we hadn't spent 13.4 million to purchase land, if instead we had set that aside for some of these improvements, and it's not about whether we do improvements or never do improvements. It's about whether we do improvements earlier than a little bit later. But if we had not allocated $13.4 million to purchasing land, we know from the fantastic work of staff that we got almost a dollar-for-dollar dollar contribution, either from a grant or from a donation of a reduction in property value from an owner who was selling their property. So that comes out to about $27 million worth of conservation property that we would not have today if we had held those funds back. And so I would challenge 
uh, anyone to look at our list of conservation lands and find me $27 million worth of property that we would feel okay pulling those lands off saying, well, we don't really, we shouldn't have conserved those because we should have taken that money and done uh, some of these access improvements quicker. Uh, I don't think there's even 10% uh, uh, of that amount of money that we would look to say uh, we shouldn't have those properties preserved today. I think every one of our properties that we have conserved uh, is something that's very special to this community. Uh, I heard, let's see, uh, you're having a lot of really good conversation about process. Uh, certainly the process can be improved upon from 2004 bonds and, and we stand ready to provide ideas. I don't know if there's a perfect way, but certainly there is a better way. And, uh, and I agree with uh, what we're hearing quite frankly from both Commissioner Moss and Commissioner Adams. Uh, it's a good discussion you know, the level to what you're putting people with expertise, and there's a lot of it. There's a lot of expertise, people who would be more than willing to dedicate their uh, time, and I'm gonna, I haven't even asked him, but I see David Cox in the audience, and I know he's a fantastic individual, and I'm gonna, you know, speak for him and say that he, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to help, as well as many others with PhDs and, and engineering backgrounds who would provide that assistance. Um, let us work with staff to come back with some ideas uh, on a process that might be more efficient. Uh, we'd certainly appreciate that. Uh, I do also want to push back a little bit uh, on some numbers about how much land is in conservation. Uh, and I think the key on that is land. When you start talking about water being in conservation, well, if you take that to its conclusion, you're looking at counting all the land underneath the Indian River Lagoon. You're technically counting 11 miles of Atlantic Ocean because technically the state boundaries and the county boundaries, I believe, go out 11 miles. Uh, so I like just looking at land, how much land is in conservation. And a, we do have a decent amount of land in conservation. Uh, I use the Florida Natural uh, uh, Acreage uh, Inventory, FNAI. It's up in Tallahassee. They're the ones who supply the information to the Florida Cabinet and DEP for when they do Florida Forever projects. And, and they pegged us in the most recent numbers that came out about two months ago, they pegged us at about 31%. And a lot of those lands are in, uh, associated with the St. John's headwaters. And it's, they're, you know, it's marshes, it's reservoirs, it's that type of thing. And it's very valuable to have, but it's not really upland. And so, uh, you know, as far as how much upland we've protected, it's, it's a much smaller number. And uh, there's no, uh, King Gruden's and, uh, Will Abinger gave fantastic presentations at the February 1st meeting to explain some of the great potential opportunities uh, for properties in our county to still preserve. I appreciate Commissioner Adams and Commissioner Moss uh, identifying those. Uh, certainly the wildlife corridor is something that's near and dear to me just because we have an opportunity to play such a fantastic role in this uh, 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 statewide program to protect a corridor for endangered species. And in fact, uh, if you remember uh, last year, uh, they've cited a Florida black bear and a Florida panther within Indian River County. So that's you know what we're fighting for and in other places as well. So uh, there's no shortage of properties that we can conserve. Uh, we came in asking for the same $50 million that was requested in 2004. We know we're not gonna get the bang for our buck. Uh, even though 2004 was obviously expensive. We know that 18 years later, just even a natural uh, inflation rate would mean we're not going to get quite the same properties preserved. We certainly would not want to lose up to $9 million of a $50 million bond to some of these improvements. We uh, came in with the idea that we wanted to use the money only for purchasing property. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien made compelling arguments at the February 1st board meeting to say, you know, we got to have some access improvements. People want to get out there. They want to see what their money brought, bought them. And, and, and we've agreed to that. And so we talked about boardwalks, trails, um, parking spaces. I think staff added some restrooms and, and we're fine with that. Uh, that's a good idea. We weren't there originally. You brought us there. Uh, it's sort of uh, what we learned uh, Thursday uh, was that, well, we now want to bring in improvements. And that's very broad. And you can easily start taking away large amounts of money for purchasing lands when you start talking about improvements. And so what we heard is, uh, well, we want to get rid of uh, nuisance uh, exotic vegetation. And so... 
we've thought about that in the last 24 hours, and, and we say, yeah, we, we can see that. You want to go on the property, you want to clear it of its nuisance, nuisance vegetation. Uh, and, and so that would be fine. And so anything that the resolution would say, uh, we want to do reasonable access improvements, uh, such as uh, trails, boardwalks, parking, and we want to make sure that we can, not necessarily have to, but we can use some funds for nuisance uh, exotic vegetation removal, uh, we would certainly support that. But we do have great concerns if, if you start going beyond that and you start looking at, you know, pulling, you know, eight, nine, ten million dollars away from a fifty million dollar bond for uh, some of these improvements. And um, if anyone has any questions, we'll certainly be prepared to answer them, hopefully. Thank you. George, I gave you guys a copy of my suggestions for Section 13. Can you all live with that or? You know, the only thing that gives us uh, somewhat heartburn is the uh, restoration of natural water flows because uh, David Cox is probably far more, uh, uh, ex has the expertise to answer that question. But if you buy, a, the problem is we don't know what's going to be purchased. If it, it, what we discussed yesterday was uh, we're going to buy environmentally significant lands and there's probably not going to be a lot of these things necessary. But I think I heard... Uh, Beth mentioned, well, maybe the St. John's will want to partner up and buy property. And, and I think what they're going to be looking at is a, an old citrus grove or maybe an old uh, ranch. And, and when you start talking about that type of water project, um, you're looking at a lot of money. I mean, you're talking about filling in ditches, canals. You're getting 404 permits. Um, that's, that's a lot. Uh, we completely agree. We, we've come around and we agree with you that exotic removal sh it can be in there. Uh, let's let's get the properties cleaned up of that. Let's get people on the property. Uh, we're hoping that's where we can get the board to land is, or on those type of improvements um, because we think that will go a long way to not creating the problem that you're facing now with this long backlog of trying to go in and create access improvements. So uh, with your language, um, you know, if we c I I exotic removal is something that we could live with. Um, we had come up with... Uh, if I may, this is sort of language that we came up with late last night or yesterday, late afternoon. Um, it's sort of, this is the uh, list of improvements that would be uh, permitted by the bond. It says, uh, we said, to construct public access improvements such as parking facilities, restroom facilities, trails, and other such infrastructure in connection thereof, together with removal of invasive exotic vegetation, along with, and then it jumps into the customary necessary <laughs> costs and expenses incurred with the acquisition, which is the language that's already there. So that's where we would like to end up, is that would cover your access improvements, and it would cover the exotic removal uh, of invasive, um, the removal of exotic invasive, invasive uh, plants. So um, if I could call Beth back up for a minute, please. Beth, um, looking at the lands we've acquired, and if you could wave a magic wand and um, when we first got them and could do what you needed to do, um, what other things, such as the exotic removal, what other initial things would you have wanted to have done, again, if you could wave a magic wand? So management costs, um, I would say exotic control, we get the most amount of help from the state. So that's probably one of the one of my lesser worries is that there's funding available through the state to do large-scale exotics restoration projects. If the bond and the commission's direction is to purchase pristine areas, then that's less of an issue. However, we are in a pyrogenic community that requires regular fire maintenance of almost all of our conservation areas with the exception of wetlands, but even some of our freshwater wetlands. But if we're starting to talk about doing wildlife corridors in the western part of our county, the management costs go up astronomically. And not only are those costs for initial improvements, but they're ongoing costs with equipment and personnel that we don't currently have. Uh, we've relied heavily on the Florida Division of Forestry to provide us with uh, services in the past. Those services have not been available for the last several years. We make do with what we can do um, mechanically. Um, we have a $37,000 budget right now. 
uh, for mechanical work just for the 2,200 acres that we have now, and maybe only half of that is upland. So you're looking at a large cost, especially if you start getting into uh, wanting to preserve large tracts of land. And then if you want to move those tracts of land into the western part of the county, you have additional complications from a staffing and contractual standpoint. I don't think that we can continue to rely on the Florida Division of Forestry. The economy is good. Uh, jobs are uh, very available for folks. They get trained. They leave. Um, so I'm not able to rely on them. And then you have difficulty. You can't contract burn areas. I'm not saying that you can't. You can. It's difficult. I, it almost makes it impossible. So some of the challenges that we have, um, and as you know, uh, we had a countywide wildfire mitigation program that we, uh, that we got grant funding from uh, through HMGP, Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. We've spent about $350,000 over the last three years just doing uh, wildfire work, um, you know, in, our, uh, in these urban service area conservation areas. It's very expensive. Um, it's also, um, you know, it's necessary. Uh, fire regimes in the western part of our county and in our flatwoods is three to five years. Scrub, thank goodness, is a little bit longer, maybe five to ten years, but because we're having to do this work mechanically, we have to do it more frequently. That being said, one of the questions in my mind is, if we're going to only buy pristine land, if we're going to rank land and we're going to say that we're only purchasing pristine land, then of course, uh, are we buying it in pristine condition? Are we having to go in and do a lot of work up front to get that, you know, conservation area where it needs to be and then to commit to the uh, management in the long term? But maybe some of our parcels are these highly degraded parcels. Maybe if you're looking at water quality, what you want to buy is something that's degraded and spend less money on the purchase and more money on the restoration. You limit yourself and you cut yourself short, in my opinion, if you don't include the language as it is um, written and presented to you from staff. Because if we, and if we only want to buy pristine land, that's fine. If that's the direction that the board gives us, if that's the you know, direction from the bond referendum, that's one thing. But if we're looking and we give this broad general thing that we want to protect water resources and that we want to protect the headwaters to the St. John's River, if we want to protect the lagoon, sometimes those um, purchases may not be pristine land. They might be situa situationally um, valuable to us. Um, or they might be taking an operation offline that currently contributes a lot of uh, contaminants to the lagoon, for instance. So that's just something to consider um, in, in the decision and the development of the language that you have before you. And so I think a lot of the things you just mentioned uh, would be fleshed out if the advisory group focuses more on technical aspects of the land. So if it is pristine, it may be 95 scored or something. If it's degraded, needs a lot of work, that might be an 85 or something. And I think that would all get sorted out in the ranking process. Um, but I, I appreciate your comments. And um, But kind of going back to your earlier comments, so one of the, other than exotic removal, because even if we buy a pristine land, in my mind, there's probably going to still be some exotics on it somewhere. I mean, it's not going to be 100% pristine. So we'd, we would... I would think we want to keep in there. We're going to do exotic removal up front. And then for what you said, maybe there might need to be an initial controlled burn um, if there's been accumulation of stuff and it's due. Um, so I'd be glad I can strike the wording about the water, natural water flows and replace that with prescribed burning or something like that um, as part of the initial uh, restoration. Um, and I think that, George, you all would be good with that? Okay. All right. Thank you, Beth, very much. Appreciate that. Can I provide one clarification as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, in regard to Hallstrom Farmstead, the current uh, budget, which is, I think, floating right around $900,000 right now for the public use improvements, does not include any of the historical structures at all. The 96 acres that the county owns is environmentally significant for many different reasons. One, we have one of the rarest mint plants uh, in the world on that property that we've managed intensely for. Secondly, we have about two and a half gopher tortoises per acre, so a very high 
uh, gopher tortoise population. All of the improvements right now are for just exactly what you mentioned before that are at Captain Forrester. There's sewer, water, restrooms, parking, trails, and boardwalks, and that is it. That does not include any historical structures at all. Okay. For yeah. And I think, I think those things will be also factored in the, the technical analysis um, of, of ranking the land, uh, you know, for purchase too. You know, what would those improvements cost? Maybe some areas where we don't don't have water and sewer would be a lot less. Things like that. So I think that would all factor into the technical ranking in my mind. So, okay. Thank you very much, Beth. Appreciate it. Commissioner Bryan, if I could. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I think replacing restoration of natural water flows for not just fire uh, controlled burns, but fire remediation, like installation of fire breaks to begin with. I see that as an initial thing. Honestly, I believe that's part of remediation. So I'd like to have remediation added back to that. Uh, <laughs> Because, and, and I'll say why, why do we need to do these things now? Um, we just installed a fire break as part of our work at, at Orca, also River Conservation Area. I think we bought that property maybe in 2008. And you know what we're de dealing with now is complaints from neighbors because that has been their backyard for 14 years. And so there are people that live there that don't even know that the county bought that. If we buy that, and everybody says, yay, it's been saved from development. If we thereafter come quickly and do some of these initial improve, improvements, pardon me, <clears throat> like, like fire breaks, we won't have, <coughs> I don't believe we'll have as many complaints about why is the county coming and cutting, uh, cutting plants out of my backyard. Um, so by, by extending these things out, the reality of that is that we, we, we run into more management problems because the time where we've saved the property has passed everyone's memory and it's more difficult for staff to manage. And then I'll just say, I wanna make sure that we know about the management responsibilities. So we, can't, we can't fund ongoing fire control or ongoing invasive removal. Um, that wouldn't be proper. We would not recommend it. it. Wouldn't be a legal use of the bond proceeds anyway. But when it comes to, to doing these things, you know, Beth, as she mentioned, started out as an army of one. She's now up to an army of four which includes Beth and Wendy and, and, and two field workers. Oh, no, wait, I should say four field workers because Beth and Wendy, you might consider their positions office dwellers, but they're out there with the volunteers to get this stuff done. Um, and we're gonna have to invest more in that. And, um, and, and we're, we're stating that today, but when we come back and it's three years from now and we're having to make budgetary decisions, this is how this happens, is because we say, oh, public safety is our top priority and environmental lands ends up somewhere down here, which is part of how it takes so long for us to invest the dollars that we need to here. So I just wanna be very clear that, that, that it's, it's, it's simple for, for people to say, buy the land and then we'll deal with it later. Um, county gets left holding the bag on that. I'll say the 5 million, 1 million was just an example, but. We've got $13.8 million, um, and, and I don't believe that will finish everything that we need to do, and that doesn't count the many millions um, that we've already spent um, doing so, some of those initial improvements. And, and if we don't want to fund those with bond proceeds, we just need to know that we're committing to more than $50 million, that we're committing to ongoing additional costs to remediate this. And I think it, you know, it just goes back to the question, are, are we... Are we trying to buy land so it doesn't develop, or are we trying to conserve property? I think what we're doing is trying to conserve property. I think the urgency may come from, well, if we don't get this property now, it may develop. But at the end of the day, I think what our, I believe our goal is, is to conserve that property. And we have a responsibility, whether it's contractual um, for some of our existing properties um, where, we, where we had cost share partners or um, a moral responsibility, I think we've got a responsibility to maintain, to put these initial improvements in and maintain them as well going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Commissioner Adams. Yes. Um, Commissioner Bright, can you restate where we are right now on the proposed language that you... Section 13, gladly. Yes. Um, so how it will read is uh, beginning um, with together with the necessary initial preservation, comma, restoration, and remediation activities to preserve and protect such property, e.g. exotic removal, fire remediation, and then including customary necessary costs, da 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 da. Okay. In an effort to kind of move this whole thing forward, 
I think that we've had a lot of really good discussion today. I think staff has gotten a lot of input on where the commission may want to see a working group going. Um, I think that it's we've had a lot of discussion on the prioritization and what may or may not be important to the commissioners. Uh, so with that being said, I would like to go ahead and move approval of the proposed resolution authorizing the referendum with the language change as proposed by Commissioner O'Brien, direct staff to take any other necessary actions to have the matter placed on the November 8th ballot. I'd also like to direct staff to update the Environmental Lands Program Guide working with um, the community partners and to bring back a proposal for a working group um, and that includes the other discussion points that we have had in this very lengthy discussion. And that would be my motion. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Moss. Um, Dylan, do you have a question or? Sure, I just wanna make sure I got this because it was slightly different than the printed version that right, was yeah. handed out. So I just wanna read it again. So section 13 will, where it says, together with the necessary initial preservation, comma, restoration and remediation activities to preserve and protect such property, e.g. exotic removal, comma, fire remediation, including customary necessary costs, and that was going forward. If, yep. that, if that is it, I, I understand the motion. Okay. And are there any other, I just wanted to know if there were any other speakers on, okay. on the item. And, Jason? and staff is good with that. We're supportive of that language, and we'll and we'll we'll take the feedback we got today on the committee slash governance issue and and, and bring it back. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, any other further public comment on this, George? You're. Uh, we greatly appreciate the commission and staff, and and we are uh, we are good to go. Thank you. Okay, great, good. Thank you. Good morning, Mike. Yeah, good morning. Commissioners, Michael Zitos is the county administrator. Just a programming note, in the next two commission meetings, you'll be receiving um, presentations on um, two of our uh, most precious conservation lands projects, including Lost Tree Islands and then the Archie Smith Ice House. So these are, uh, one is an action item, one is an update, but these provide an excellent opportunity to look back and from acquisition to improvement and see how that process is worked excuse me and that will give you a, um, a very good um, uh, practical view of how you want to um, establish the committee and the process going forward great thank you Mike yes, sir. any other final public comment seeing none we have a motion by Commissioner Adams second by Commissioner Moss all in favor signify with aye aye, aye. any opposed aye that motion carries four to one with Commissioner Flesher opposed. We're going to take a 10 minute break. Uh, commissioners will be back here at 1047.
uh, sector seven beach and dune restoration and project and mr spirit slideshow today on sector seven you know we, Vinny taught me well when he was around so i'm, I'm trying to keep that going mm. you want me to play some music to go along with your slideshow <laughs> <laughs> all righty so um sector seven the beach and dune restoration project that we have uh, on the books so just a little background for everybody Sector 7 is considered cri critically eroded by DEP, and we've lost about 1.5 feet of Sector 7 uh, with about 82, with 82 properties. Uh, Sector 7 was re-nursed in 2007 following the 2004 hurricane season, uh, and they placed about 362,000 cubic yards. So Sector 7, you can see the project area. The closest park access is the city park to the north, which is 1.4 miles. And then there's Round Island Beach Park, which is about 1.9 miles to the south. Sector 7 does not have public access. There are no public parks within Sector 7. So what is public beach access? So public beach access defined by DEP, uh, and this is one of the definitions they look when they rank any type of funding, is an entry zone in associated parking under public ownership or control, which is specifically used for providing access to the adjacent sandy beach for the general public. The access must be signed, maintained, and clearly visible from the adjacent roadway. Parking space is counted for eligibility must be within a quarter mile walking distance from the lateral entry zone and available to the public. As I said earlier, based on this definition, there is no public access within Sector 7. So back in June of 2020, I believe it was, uh, the, the board decided to set a 90% or greater amount for signed easements. Uh, that was our target, targeted goal to obtain easements for all three sectors. Um, in Sector Five, we had 90% in sector, if I believe, if I remember correctly, in sector three, we had 88%. Um, some of the methods that we've used to get and obtain easements are, you know, mass mailings, the board meetings, Beach and Shores Preservation Advisory Committee, emails, phone calls, webinars, newspapers, homeowners associations, condos associations, civic groups, um, nature conservancy, conservancy groups, and we actually had a group of HOA uh, individuals who went and visited different eight other HOAs, um, and they're here today, and they were, they went and they visited with these people and talked to these people and tried to get easements to make this project move forward, and we do appreciate that. So looking at the easements that we have and the kind of how it's gone for the past year, as you can see across the, in this chart, basically in April of 2021, we had 51 easements out of the 82 we needed. And as of January 2022, we gained three. In process, the ones that were in process in April 2021, we actually gained two of those into granted easements, if my memory serves me correctly. We're still pending some responses from uh, some of the property owners, and then 14 of them have denied them outright. So let's kind of, again, looking at this, you can see in the chart just where we're at right now. We've got 66% of uh, our total of 90, um, 18 denied, 15 in pending, and then we've got one that's under review that's being recorded. And that's uh, of a couple weeks ago. So sector seven. So let's look at the north. Most of our easement issues are either in the north or the south. So for this one, for this slide and the next couple, we're gonna focus in the north. So the north, as you can see, we have a, some pendings and denials. Basically, we can't get responses back. Um, some people just don't want any sand, um, but they're not, we're not ready to make them denials yet. We're still trying, as is other people. Um, a closer look at sector seven. So this is the north area, as you can see, the reds and the yellow and, and reds. Um, it causes a problem. North side of Sector 7, this is a feeder beach. This is where we're going to put a majority of our sand, about 43%. <clears throat> Without this feeder beach, we take 
um, we're going to have some, some sand issues as it erodes and moves the sand to the south. Uh, we really need to put sand on this beach to make this a viable project uh, based on the information that we have. So sector seven is basically 2.2 miles and it had about 295,000 cubic yards of sand is what we're proposing to put on there. Now due to the near the hard bottom, the near shore hard bottom, uh, the northern limit is where 43, 43% of our sand's gonna go or about 126,000 cubic yards uh, in that feeder beach area I was just talking about. And again, the benefit of the feeder beach design is to nourish the southern portion of the project through natural longshore north to south sand movement. So now we'll shift to, to the south. Same, same issues as the north really. Um, we have access issues or we have uh, easement issues to the south. Um, there's no feeder beach down here, um, but there, there's an access issues if we were to, you know, think about coming from the south uh, from sector eight. And um, so here's some of the constructability issues we would have if we tried to basically truck sand from the south, which would be an enormous undertaking and very expensive. Um, you can see where we'd have some seawall issues where the tides come in and we couldn't run the trucks in the water uh, for fear of just causing a mess out there. So here's where we had to, we shut down right after this because the tide was coming up. This was, I believe, during a king tide, um, but we got caught in this one, and these were the last few trucks before we pulled out of there. Same thing here. We were just trying to haul the best we could as the tide was coming up, and um, not a good thing for what we were trying to do. Again, we shut down right after these pictures were taken. And it's not good for the equipment to be running in the salt water like this. So why we're here today is basically we've got some options for you. Um, basically, we've got, to, we've got to look for board input on how we want to move forward with Sector 7, how we want to proceed. Mm -hmm. So with the options, we have option one, which is to continue to seek the remaining easements necessary to make the project viable to perform pre-construction monitoring in accordance with our permit conditions uh, and adjust our template accordingly, we'd have to pull the trigger basically next month in order to start our pre-construction monitoring, and that would cost us about $250,000. Um, we still not be able to construct it. We don't know at this point, but if we wanted to try to go to construction with what we have, if it was feasible, we'd have to start almost, you know, in April. So we can, with this option, we prepare the bid package like we normally do, advertised in July, open in September, and then come back to the board with a bidding purpose, uh, with the, the bids and the easements that we would have. Option two. Option two, we can go ahead and determine that the project not be constructible this year. So we wouldn't pursue the pre-construction monitoring. Uh, that would be $250,000 we wouldn't spend. We can seek extensions of the funding currently available for the project, which is we have you know, several, DEP, <coughs> LGFR grant, uh, FEMA, uh, DEM funds available. Uh, we can con per, uh, potentially pursue construction in 23-24 construction window. Um, the permits that we do have for Sector 7 are good for 15 years. So we have, you know, we have that timing with DEP permits. So option three. So option three is just to, to determine the project is not constructible. Based on all the, the lack of stakeholder support in the signing of easements and the lack of public access as defined by DEP. What would this mean? Well, this would mean we'd have to surrender our, our FEMA, DEM, and FDEP grants and then any future projects would be solely funded by the county. So, after, after, after careful and thorough consideration of all options, Eric wrote this, by the way. <laughs> Who is the boss? Staff recommends option three, which states the following. 
determined the project not to be constructible at all based on the lack of sufficient support in signing of easements and the lack of public access as defined uh, by DEP. Surrender our, our grants and again, the, the project would be funded by the county if we ever were able to obtain easements. So basically in a, in a nutshell, the easement issue, we're at an impasse. For the last, you know, I'd say two years, we, we've been stuck around this 50, this 60 percent, these 54, 55, 56 easements. We're, we're not seeing any movement on one side or the other. And it's not from a lack of trying. It is not. I will say that the, the community has tried. Um, the, it's just not a lack of trying. We just don't see anything slow. We don't see any change in it right now. Um, additionally, so everybody's aware, we've been looking for property that we could do a trucking. You know, basically, if we tried to do this, we could get a piece of property that we could use to put trucks on the beach so we could haul this in, not having any, any luck with that. The vacant property that we used last time we did this has a house on it now. Um, there's one other location that we, we thought we would be able to use, but they're not even interested in talking to us. Uh, the only other option is to buy a house uh, on the beach. We, all, we know what that's gonna cost us and use that access um, you know, for, to get onto the beach. The only, other, the only way to do this project if we move forward, when it, whichever option is chosen is more than likely, unless we can find access that we can get to, would, is gonna be to dredge it. Um, dredging is going to be expensive. If we can't put 43% or 126,000 cubic yards on the feeder beach, that 294, 95,000 now becomes you know, less than 200,000 cubic yards. And the last bid we got, um, Mobilization alone was $5.1 million right out of the get-go because they got to set up all the dredge and, the, and all the equipment. They got to barge in the equipment because we can't even bring it in. Um, they have to barge the, the dozers and what they need onto the beach and probably have to take some, based on what I've seen, take it off the beach during high tide because they can't let it sit there. Um, so the beach advisory, moving on to the beach advisory committee. We presented to them uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, on the 28th. And at that meeting, the Beach, uh, the Beach and Shores Preservation Advisory Committee recommended the BCC uh, pursue option two, the postponement of the project for another year so that staff can continue to pursue easement agreements on the holdout properties with the understanding that the negative response may be received on request and, may, and made to extend the deadlines of the funding made available to the project. So I will tell you that we pushed FEMA specifically on funding, extending the project last year. And we got their approval. I don't know if we'll be successful or not this year. It doesn't hurt to ask if that's the option that you guys choose, um, but I can't guarantee, we can't guarantee the funding's gonna be available. And this is the letter from uh, Dave Barney, the chairman of the Beach and Shores Advisory Committee, that basically talks about option two. So with that, Eric's here to answer any questions you may have. No, oh, no, no, no. Commissioner, is there any questions of Rich? Commissioner Fleischer. Uh, for you and for uh, Dylan as well, uh, and clarification for the public, the easements that we were seeking are for accessibility to the improvement. It does not provide any access accessibility to the public since there's no public access points. Is that correct? I will let Dylan answer that question. So the, oops, um, the public easements that we were seeking from the property owners, which are the, the same as they were in sector three and sector five, had three main components to them. Uh, the first was the uh, easement that would allow for the construction of the project. Uh, the second was to allow for the uh, survey of, of sea turtles uh, within the project. And the third was to allow, allow for the customary use of the beach by the public, um, similar to the customary use concept under the law. Uh, those were the three things that we had asked for under the easement uh, in both sectors three, sector five, and sector seven. We are asking for public access. 
So it's basically an acknowledgement um, that the public can continue to use the beach for the traditional uses that the public has used the beach for. That is a component of it. That is correct. Which travel under state law. Now, uh, as Rich stated, we, we are still 1.4 miles from South, the South Beach Park, and we're still 1.9 miles from the Round Island Park, but those were still the items in the easement. So there's really a remote likelihood that people will be traveling along the beach for a mile or to two to sit and sunbathe. From those parks, recreate. it would take a while to get to. I know there are people who live in that community who would be able to walk up and down the beach as well. And we need those. Uh, we need the access so we can get the sand to the beach. And we have a large portion of individuals who uh, don't believe in that uh, approach. And uh, with that, I believe that option three uh, is just retreat and scrub the launch. And option one, well, uh, I, I, I don't think that's doable either. Uh, as far as the uh, project itself, there'll be far too many gaps. And uh, I believe that will be counterproductive uh, for the funding mechanism for the sand, it would be just squandered at that point. I do fully support uh, the option two uh, because option two can revert into option three uh, if we do not get the approval. Oops. See, that's in, that's in my, uh, that's, on, that's on my playlist. Is that your playlist? My playlist. <laughs> playlist. Okay. That's your music for next week's board meeting. You got something planned? Yeah, buddy. Okay, well, well, I hope it is good as this plan because uh, the plan that came back from uh, Beach and Shores, uh, a highly respected group, a group that I've worked with for many years, Joe works with them now. Um, I, I have to say that we're, we're, we're getting good information uh, I can appreciate uh, staff's thought process saying this has been a long road, two years, two years of trying to get the understanding and acceptance, but we just worked uh, an hour on land conservation and two years on this was a little bit more time. So I would fully support option two if you believe that we can, we can at least have the ask for the extension. I, I know it was it was a hard press, mm -hmm. but we can at least try. Mm -hmm. Don't give up the ship. We can ask. That's questions for now. Yep. Vice Chair Ehrman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I'm the liaison for the beach and shores, and we have done some pretty good work there. Those those yeah. those folks do a pretty good job, and I'm proud to be associated with them. But it is very frustrating for them just as it is for staff and it is for us to to not see these easements uh, assigned and it seems to be just the perpetuity language in it that some of them have an issue with I, I don't understand why anybody wouldn't want sand on their beach to and to enhance it I, I really can't comprehend that to, to make it a, a, a much better place and a much better thing uh, but that's the way they feel that's the way they feel uh, I, I know I'm very frustrated with it, and, and my my uh, emotions tell me to, to just, you know, look, let's just go with option three, and we're sorry you don't have any sand on the beach, and we're, we're done with it. That's what my emotions are telling me to do, because because I am just like staff and, and the beach and shore folks. We're, we're getting really, really kind of tired of it, and we, we wish that people would, would take this opportunity to, to get the sand. But I, 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 I like you. I'll use your quote. I'm not, I'm not ready to give up the ship. I'm I'm always, you know, hopeful. There's that one in a million. There's still a chance, you know. Uh, even even with that, um, I would have to say I'm gonna, I, you know, I'm gonna, as, as commissioner now. I'm gonna have to go with the with the beach and shore folks. Uh, they 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 vetted this pretty well, and and I understand that I'm I'm gonna support option two, but if we can't get the extensions uh, from FEMA and, and, and uh, DEP, then 
it, it's all for naught. I think that answers our question. So I think we, I, I, I'm going to go with option two right now, just to just to just to vet it out, see what uh, see what the state says, and we'll go from there. That may answer our question that that the money's not there, and we have to drop back and go to option three. But right now, I'm going to go with option two. But this is this is a very very frustrating thing for me. It's one of the since I've been a commissioner, it's one of the most frustrating things I think that I've Has I've been, had yeah. to deal with, especially being the liaison on the on the committee. But that's kind of where I'm at right now, okay. Mr. Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Adams. <coughs> sure, um, Rich. I know you went over some of this in your commentary, but I just have I want to reiterate some of this stuff for my own that I didn't that I didn't get lost or get it wrong. How many times have we put this off and sought an extension? This would be the, this will be the third time. Third time, third time right. And how many new easements did we get over the course of the past two extensions? I'd have to go back and look, but I can say from the last time, the last extension just for the last year, we got three. If we seek an extension, is there a guarantee that funding will still be available? Say that again? If, the, if we seek an extension from FEMA, is there a guarantee that funding would still be available for the project? The funding is allocated okay. for, the, for the project. They haven't moved it. They haven't taken it away. So the funding right now is still there. Um, so all we can do is ask them to hold on to that funding for an additional year. Typically, how long will, or how many extensions will they approve before they will decide that the project's not going to happen and reallocate the funding? I honestly can't tell you this. I've never gone and gotten more than two extensions. The third extension in my previous life was not not approved. So I, this is new territory for me. So there's a possibility that they won't approve the extension. There's a possibility. Okay. There is always a possibility. We fought. We had heated conversations or discussions with DEP uh, and FEMA the last time we extended it so I don't know where this is going to go this time okay. all we can do is ask there's been staff changeover at DEP at FDM and so we're dealing with a whole new set of people they may be more amenable to extending it in today's climate based on you know the, the way the economy is going into rising costs it may be good for them to extend it so we can keep the cost down don't know until we have, have that conversation with them so what are what would be in your opinion our options if they were to say no to an extension then i mean obviously you'd have to come back here but what would that conversation look like well basically if they if they do not if we can't get them to do it first thing we, i would do is come back to the board of course and there may be another way that we can um see politically try to get them to extend it there, there are other avenues above my pay grade, above Jason's pay grade, that we could try to get them to extend it, of course. Um, that would be the first thing that I would try. Because sometimes new staff makes decisions based on black and white rather than the reality of the world we live in. So sometimes we can get uh, the, the people that are above my pay grade or uh, in higher positions to see how the economy is going, see how things are, and make that determination for them. Um, okay, and then if the project was to move forward to construction, we still have the issue of access. So the FEMA grant at this point, does that contemplate or would that include additional cost for possibly having to barge in all that stuff or would that be something that we would have to supplement as a county? We would have to supplement the the money the funding is set we're only going to get x okay. from fema based on the dollar amounts and the cubic yards of sand that we had to that we um, provided to them when we started this three years ago uh, there will be no additional money uh, we we've basically been allocated the money we're going to get uh, so if there's a cost increase let's just say we go to dredging and it, dredging prices have doubled the county is going to have to make up that difference. Okay. 
Um, and then how how much have we already spent on design and engineering for this project, or have we done that at this point? I'm going to say we're approaching about a million dollars there. Yeah. About a million in all of our design and our all the basically the stuff we've had to do um, outside of staff time. That's not included in there. That's just consultants' costs and survey costs and things like that. If we were to seek an extension and assuming it was granted, would we have to redesign or engineer anything? I mean, would those costs continue to go up or is that going to be a static cost until the project starts? The, the design is done and it's permitted. However, we would have a cost of about, mm, I'm going to say around $80,000 to do another survey because we, a, we have to do a survey of the existing conditions before we get started. So that will be an additional cost that we'll have. Now we could see accretion, we could see the sand, the, the amount of sand we need go down, could go up, we, we don't know. But we do these about every six months. And that would be in addition to the additional possible construction cost for access, as well as the monitoring that you spoke about earlier? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then my final question at this point, and I'm, I'm depending, I might have some more in the future. Um, we as a government are prohibited from making improvements on private property, correct? That is correct. So in order to make any kind of improvements, which includes the addition of sand, we would need some type of easement to allow that to happen. Otherwise, we would be making improvements to private property. Absolutely correct. We are prohibited from using taxpayer dollars to make improvements to private property. Uh, it's plain as day. Um, the easements allow us to use taxpayer dollars or whatever funding source to go onto private property to improve private property with taxpayer dollars or however we're funding this option. Without those easements, we cannot do that, regardless of the funding source. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Moss? Yes, thank you. Um, first, thank you for your huge effort um, on this. Um, as, and as you pointed out in your presentation, there have been, there's been at least one uh, household that, or piece of property that switched from denied to, uh, to gr the green light, giving the green light. And considering that we are now experiencing this very active uh, real estate market, uh, we might expect other pieces of property uh, to change hands. Um, um, so I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, with regard to the situation. Um, I would support option two um, and what the uh, Beach and Shores uh, Commission has, uh, has reviewed. Um, that would be my, uh, my, my take on this. But thank you again for, for all of your efforts. I appreciate that. I don't know when you need a motion, but when you do, you let me know. Uh, um, so right now in staff report, they're estimating the total project cost to be 12 million, and we're getting 5.9 million in these grants. So we, we're still having to come up with 6 million from other sources, either tourist tax or sales tax, other, other taxpayer funds to put sand on a beach that has zero public access. And I, I find it incomprehensible that these property owners can't see that fact that they're getting benefit from the general public to protect their home, and yet they don't want to sign the easement. And Rich, correct me if I'm wrong, with that 12 million, that was still assuming a, a land-based um, um, project and if we go with the offshore and you mentioned I think about five million just for the mob D mob it's hard it, without knowing the easements if we were to bid it right now with the two let's just say we have a hundred percent easements and we're going to put all 295,000 cubic yards I would say that it's going to be in the high range of high 12 million to low 14 million somewhere that's where we think it'll be based on what I'm seeing in dredging right now, because I did some research prior to mm -hmm. the meeting, of course. Uh, if we drop that amount, let's just say we do not get all the easements, and we only put, let's say, 200,000. You actually may see a $14 million project for 
200,000 cubic yards rather than 295,000 cubic yards. It's just the amount of sand that has to be pumped. It's the cost factor that the guys, that the dredgers look at. If they can't pump, you know, hundreds of thousands of sand, then it's not worth them to set it up. So now your mob cost goes up. Um, the second thing about that is, is, is the project, you know, going to be viable without a bunch of easements? Well, DEP and FEMA have looked at question, and I'll just be, you know, we got questions on sector three because we left out some of the properties. Um, we were able to show them, you know, where they were. They were mostly in the north, and, and they were good with that. Um, but that is, has come up. It didn't come up in sector five, but it did come up in sector three. So I don't know where that would go in, in sector seven if we had a bunch of easements that we, a bunch of places we couldn't put the sand in. FEMA might, might say, or DEP might say, you didn't meet your burden to protect the entire sector. Therefore, we're not going to give you any money. So that's just there. Uh, I just want to make sure you guys know that because we did have that conversation when we were closing out sector, when we were getting ready to finish out yeah. sector three. And, you know, if I'm sitting in FEMA or DEP shoes, um, and, you know, we more, each year the, the hurricane season seemed to be a little bit more activity, more powerful. I'm thinking, well, okay, this must not really be an emergency down there in New River County because they keep postponing it. I'm going to reallocate these funds to a community that wants these dollars to restore their beach. So I, I'm thinking it's getting more and more doubtful to even get an extension. Um, but I go back to the fact there's absolutely zero public access in this section and that for us to spend anywhere from six to eight million more dollars in other taxpayer funds to build basically a private beach, I, I just don't find acceptable. I think we've gave them their shot. It, we more than gave them enough opportunities to come around. Um, you know, I always use the analogy a lot of times of being a good parent. And to be a good parent means sometimes you have to say no. And, and then your kid screams at you and calls you all bad names, says they hate you or, you know, they're going to run away, fine, right when you get there, but the answer is still no. And the bad parent is the one that keeps saying, well, yeah, it's okay, it's okay, uh, we'll, we'll give you a little more time, we'll do this, you know. And at some point, we've we got to make a decision here. Um, and I'm, I'm supportive of option three. I think we've given them more than ample opportunities to come around. Uh, I, the, the people that are against this, I don't think are going to change. Um, so do we really want to hang all of our hopes on the fact that, what do we need, about 10 of the houses to sell and have new owners that are favorable? I mean, I don't see that happening. And so I think we're wasting money, we're wasting staff time, we're wasting everything. And I'd rather have our resources directed to things where people want us there, people want us doing things than where all of these people don't want us there. So I'm, I'm supportive of option three. Um, and I think we just need to move on from this and be done with it. So, Commissioner Flesher. Um, that, I'd be happy to debate that point with you as far as the staff cost factor, but I rather, you know, we have the opportunity to hear from some of the folks who responded here today. Sure, yeah. if we're done with our comments. So, do you have anything else, or? No, I'm, okay. I want to make a motion, but I want to okay. hear from them. All right, so is there anyone from the public that wishes to comment? Yes, sir. If you, welcome. Give your name and address for the record, please. Hi, my name's Jim Field. I live at 1830 Sand Dollar Way. So I'm a Sector 7 resident. Uh, right, thanks very much for the opportunity to present to the board. Um, I represent uh, a large group of residents in <coughs> Sector 7 who are equally frustrated with this process and feel underrepresented by the process that has been put in place by the county to work this entire issue. If you think you're frustrated with the handful of property owners who haven't signed for whatever reason, then you should live next to them. <laughs> And when you try to get to the basic psychology of the holdouts, there is no psychology. The numbers are very small, right? We're working with handfuls of recalcitrant homeowners who, for their own reasons, don't have a 
bigger version of a public good and for their own reasons decide that they have beliefs about the ecosystem and impacts on the reef and things like that. And when you listen to them, you have to hold back from telling them that they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So that's who we represent here. There's a lot of us very frustrated with this. And I'll go through the numbers in terms of the underrepresented people who don't have a voice in this at all because of the way that this process has worked. Um, and many of us are in the HOAs and our community leaders in our neighborhoods who think very seriously about this. Um, I am somewhat recent to this area, I'm here four years. I spent a lot of years growing up in the Outer Banks. If you haven't been to the Outer Banks to see where beaches fail, you should go see it. It's not just wealthy people who get wiped out because their homes are in water, it's the whole community, it's the whole neighborhood. It's the whole tourist industry. It's done forever. So when we're talking about Sector 7, we're talking about about 10% of the county's 24 and a half miles of beach. So it's not insignificant. So the notion is you can write it off, but you're writing off 10% of the beach. And that's pretty significant. On my own time, I wrote an article for Vero Beach Magazine in August on the beach renourishment project. I did a lot of research. I talked to a lot of people. I tried to be very objective. In some way, I am an outsider. And so I get to see the frustration that has mounted here. I see the positions that have formed here. And I think my own personal opinion now, and end of one on this, people have been in this for too long. Lost perspective on the bigger picture. And that's what I want to talk about right now. Packing it in is shocking to see this. We've worked with the county people now, talked repeatedly, and we hadn't seen option three before, which is pack it in. And I just, I, I find that shocking for the implications going down the pike for the people who live here and will live here and their families will live here. This is 10% of the beach in the county that you want to let go. And if you've seen what it's looked like in communities where you've let it go, it's ugly. And when I wrote the article for Vero Beach Magazine, I don't know who reads those things, but I was very generous. I was proud of what the county had done with the beaches. You've spent a lot of money. It could be spent elsewhere for these beaches. And I personally think it's the best thing you can possibly do for the community for the people who live there, for our quality of life, for the economy, and also for all of the conservation issues. So this is a big deal. This is writing off 10%. It's not an insignificant thing. And I was proud. Had I written the article today, I would have been less proud because we're at an impasse right now where we just saw you want to pack it in. And I would argue, we would argue, many of us, that it's a self-made impasse. Does it have to be like this? You know, this is packing it in when people in public positions should be working towards solutions. Solutions. You're paid to find solutions. And sometimes solutions require compromise. And that's what it is. Without compromise, you don't get it. That's the nature of politics. It's the nature of, of doing this. And I'd say what we see represented in the third option is a lack of willingness to compromise, to be realistic about some of the options. But after a while, when you have your own formed opinions, then it's inflexible, and there are no options, and that's where you are right now, in my opinion. So we've worked very well with your staff. They've been extremely helpful and generous, and we really do approach this in the kindest of ways. We're all trying to pull for the right things here. So I don't mean any animosity here. These, your folks, the staff, have been very respectful and very good to work with and, and those sorts of things. So, so take this for what you will. Look at the numbers on Sector 7, okay? It's 10% of the county beach. There are approximately 1,800 residences and 3,000 voters of the county. All right, so when we're talking about small minorities of people, again, Go to these neighbors, a handful 
for their own reasons don't want to do this, and I would personally agree, if I owned beachfront property and you offered this to me, I'd be all over it. I did in another state, and they never had something like this. It's a gift. But for their own reasons, they don't see it. And when you're talking about public access, okay, as defined by that particular language we talked about, I would have a different definition of public access. There are 1,800 residences and 3,000 voters of the county who live there. That is a different definition of public, but it's a lot of people. And when you add in visitors and children and, and, and relatives and everything else, we're talking about thousands of people here, all right, who are impacted by this. All right, in contrast, the beachfront owners who have requested to sign the easements are 82. 82 out of 3,000, all right? 164 voters out of 3,000. In my community, we have 18 beachfront properties. Everyone signed except for one home, and that person passed away. But we all signed, we all saw it as a community, and the next community down from us, everybody signed in that community. As you saw on the map, we have a cluster of properties to the north and a cluster of properties to the south. But you have huge stretches of green where people have signed on and have recognized it as a huge benefit, in fact, that it is. We're here in good faith, we understand that. So the one thing I would say about this is just think about public access. It doesn't have public access. These communities were built 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. They were built contiguously. Some is, you know, gated communities and other ones not. That's just what we inherited in terms of the real estate. They didn't have a public park there, but I mean, that's just the way that these things were built. So in sum, there's a lot of people at stake here, and there's a very small number of people who had said no to this, all right? And they do cluster out, but, but the notion about public access, I would say there's thousands of us on this thing. In terms of these people not understanding the generosity, yes, the majority do. We're talking about 90% of the people do, you know, when you get the larger number of people involved in this. So working with small numbers has not been helpful. All right, the tally of beachfront owners who have responded, uh, not responded, or responded no, it's 27 properties, a tiny percentage as I talked about before. 1.5% of households in our sector, 1.5% are making a decision that impacts 98.5% of us. It's just wrong. It's, it's just wrong. And you can give me all the reasons why it is the way that it is, it's undemocratic, period. It's just not fair to the large majority of people. We believe that while the efforts to obtain funding and gathered assessments performed by the county have been in good faith and demonstrate a strong work effort from the staff, we nonetheless wonder why we are in this predicament. So few speaking for the rights right here and, and basically negating the rights of all of these other people in here. And it's because of the process that you basically outlined here. At this juncture on Sector 7, we've had good discussions with the staff and so forth. It's also been very frustrating because when we talk to the staff, I'll be completely honest with you, all we hear when we sit down is the, is the reasons why it can't get done. It's always why it can't get done. And what we've gone in there is tried to say, well, let's come up with a solution. Isn't there a fix to this in some particular way? Let's like start over on this and think rationally about it. But instead of constructing that we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, how about a different approach to the impasse? How about let's look at some different options and see what we can actually do on this. Specifically, let's talk about the easement language. All right, this one, I've looked at this for two years. I'm an outsider to this whole thing. I come to this whole notion about easements in perpetuity. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Just take a step back from this. Perpetuity, perpetuity, you don't need perpetuity. You can do 50 years, you can do 30 years, you can do 40 years. It doesn't have to be in perpetuity. And in my article, I outline the reasons in favor of perpetuity. 
I get it. In perpetuity may stand you better for funding from FEMA, right? The language. Perpetuity is a lot easier to collect the signatures so you don't have to go every 30 years and recollect it and do all of the administrative work. I mean, it's a big part of in perpetuity was for the benefit of the staff not having to chase after easements every X number of years and have the language be standardized and all the rest of these things. But the reality is, hey, for what we're talking about here, what's wrong with like 30 years on this whole thing and make it project specific? You know, the staff are paid to do administrative work. And I just don't think administrative easement and efficiency basically stands up as a reason for flushing 10% of the beach down the toilet. While we recognize the value of the county staff to have perpetuity, we believe the value of getting this project done far outweighs any of the language here. We've never, we've asked repeatedly for different language for these easements. Just throw something out. Come up with two other versions of a perpetual easement at a 50 or a 40 or be creative with the language. Make it project specific. The reason is the people don't like perpetuity. They don't like perpetuity. Eternity. And there's got to be something short of perpetuity. But that's really the point. If you would eliminate perpetuity from it, you'd see a significant change. We've talked to these people. For each holdout, we went and talked, tried to talk, you know, as their neighbors to find out what the holdouts were. And you do get a difference of opinion in small numbers on different things. But overwhelmingly, if you took out perpetuity and replaced it with something shorter, okay, then you get a whole swing. You can't change the language because it would be unjust or unequitable because you made the other folks sign a perpetual easement. And I would say it's, not, it's also not equitable to basically grant people sand in one area and not grant people sand in another. So we're talking about two types of inequities. Inequities in terms of signing something, I get it. But again, driving towards a solution can mean Maybe you sign slightly different language on here. You asterisk it. You say it's only for these reasons as statute of limitation. Whatever you want to do on it to get the job done. But that's also inequitable to hold the language and then deny you know, sand to so many different people. In terms of the engineering sectors, again, we recognize the severe difficulties of what we just talked about and discussed. But the reality is you can take and group a bunch of homes in the very north, carve them out because they have more sand than everybody else, put them up into sector six because they probably have accruing beaches there, and all of a sudden you change that whole dynamic, but we, we understand that the engineering sectors, however they're defined, at one time eight sectors for engineering reasons are, you can't change them under any circumstances. I thought they're man-made eight sector dividing lines. Why, why can't they be adjusted? We tried for that and had no progress on that. We also talked about pumping in sand. Where I come from, that's the standard. Nobody trucks sand in. It's all pumped. That's up in Delaware. That's up in New Jersey. That's up in parts of North Carolina, Virginia. So I understand it's more costly, but if you can't get it by truck, then you do it the way everybody else is doing it, and you pump it. So it is an anomaly for what your current practice is, but you had done it in the past, and other people do too. It's just an example about how intransigent people have gotten to the point where it's just out and out dismissal of an option used elsewhere to deal with the problem, but it isn't discussable here. It's like don't even mention it because it's off the charts. In terms of reaching out and talking to these homeowners, we found when we went and talked to people that really nobody knew much about the issue at all. Even the homeowners involved had no idea. <clears throat> We'd been told about all the PR that had been done, all the personal outreach and everything else. The vast majority of people have no idea what's going on. Even the homeowners involved in this thing were highly uneducated about this. Some of the outreach from people from the county wasn't a good, weren't good people to, to send to those conversations. They weren't well scripted. 
They didn't understand the issues. They were completely outgunned by people who own these properties. One-way conversation wasn't persuaded, and I would say that the people representing the county's opinion didn't represent the county very well. And so that was something when we talk about we did all of this education and things like that, you can never do enough education. So where are we right now in this? Let's talk about the real world, okay? This is what you're confronted with. You wanna write it off, here's what we got. We're in an impasse, all right? You have language on perpetuity which isn't gonna fly with some people. If you remove that, it changes the whole dynamic. So don't change it, so, so put it out there. Leave it as it is. So what's gonna happen is the county will have failed in beach reclamation for 10% of the beaches and for thousands of people, thousands of people who live here. Two, we're not gonna get FEMA, it's gonna go away. I understand once that money is gone, it doesn't come back because it was given as part of post-hurricane funding. And so we're, we're just never gonna get FEMA money again, ever, okay? So play that out. That means that we have a lot of money to spend. We don't have FEMA funding. The state really doesn't chip in that much. And the county then has, has this, a huge proportion of it. And you've got other things to do too. So you leave the beach go, so the beach loses sand forever. Unless there's a catastrophic hurricane that comes through, we'll never get funding. And so every year we lose more and more and more sand on that part. Right now, just south of where I live, a number of the houses, a large number, have started to armor themselves. So walk down and you see a brand new piece of armor up, then the next one, then the next one, and then the next one. Whole huge sector has gone into armoring. And, you know, for their own reasons, they've done this. Maybe they've looked at this particular situation. But if you know what it's like to armor a beach, in five years, there's no beach left in front of where the armor is. That's the truth. Turtles don't go there anymore because they can't nest. So at some point, you're going to write off 10%, three-mile, two-and-a-half-mile stretch for turtle nesting. One thing leads to another here. And you're just going to have an eyesore and a dysfunctional beach and no place for turtles in a large stretch of the beach. And that's what's going to happen. And it's going to be in perpetuity because we will never get funding again on FEMA barring a catastrophe on this thing. So you're basically writing it off means writing it off in a big way. And we think the people who live here, the thousands of people, think that's unacceptable for stewards of the public good in the county to tell thousands of people to basically pack sand or not pack it. And I just don't think that's a great outcome in service to the people who pay taxes, contribute to the community, and live here. Our ask today, very simple, not number three. And this is where I get to this notion about being too close to it. I think people need to take a deep breath on this. Honestly, the lines are drawn and sometimes there's some personal pride I sense in this. Where it's because you can't make sense of crazy people who don't get the good that we're doing for them and you get frustrated with them. Well, we share that too, but I would only say these people are a minority, a tiny group of people where all share the frustration, but you can't let the personal pride and the frustration take over what is, should be rational decision making here and hoping for the best because you don't know what's actually going to happen. We'd like to see a few commissioners step up and take this as a personal issue for them, to take this on, something as important as any other issues, to get involved, roll up the sleeves. Ask the staff to come back with two or three option Bs, which is walk off the ledge of the perpetuity, take the two sides that are in an impasse and try to find some common ground on this thing. Ask for some middle ground language on here. 
where we can begin to talk and get people involved in this thing. Ask us to go back again of shorter perpetuity and talk to these people again. We'll be the front, the front people to do this for the county with a larger perspective and a larger good to make another good faith effort to do this sort of thing. So that's we're, we're all want to roll up the sleeves and get this thing done. But we would just like a little bit of cooperation and, and people scrubbing in here because this is very, very important and you don't want to give it up. So that, that's where we stand right now. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak? Yeah. Good morning. Welcome. Your name and address, please. Hi, Commissioner. My name is Laurie Barkhorn, and I live at 1778 Coral Way North in Seagrove. Um, thanks so much. Um, I've worked very closely with the county staff, um, and uh, they've been an excellent help throughout this process. Um, as with Jim, uh, I'm really here to be a voice of the people who live in my community who are not beachfront owners but have um, a lot of interest in this, um, in this uh, project because they do use the beach every day. We have very few beachfront owners, and yet we have 167 folks in our in our community who do use the beach and consider it part of the value of their homes and their property, like the 3,000 other voters that Jim was referring to. I'm not gonna repeat the things that he said, which are all items we've discussed and created talking points together, and I wholeheartedly support, but I'd like to make a few points based on what I heard um, today. Um, first of all, I'd like to validate the fact that I understand Rich's team's frustration. There are obstacles to getting the project done, one of which is getting these um, folks to, to sign easements or to find a way of getting it done otherwise. So there, the obstacles are understandable, but you deal with obstacles every day, as do all of us in work, and we're sure we can achieve those if we take a more flexible approach to this. Um, I have to say I really didn't appreciate the way that the, the folks on the beachfront were characterized here um, by some of the commissioners. I have spoken to these people. Some of these people are our neighbors, despite the fact that they may have significantly greater assets or different perspectives from us. Some of them are very long-term Vero Beach residents. They are thoughtful human beings who care deeply about their property values and have different opinions about uh, whether, the, whether the beach replenishment will work, um, how it will affect our environment. They've taken the time, some of them, to read the environmental studies. So I, I don't appreciate the way that they were characterized. And knowing the sector as intimately as I think some of us who are neighbors do, there are folks there who, um, if you really do look at it as a little bit of a microcosm, the northern part of the sector there are folks who have lived there for a very long time, multiple generations in their family, who feel that's an accretive beach. And I don't think our engineers would disagree with us. There are folks in the bottom who bought homes or built homes newly where there is almost no beach left, and they're building seawalls. And then there's the vast group in the middle, which a couple of guys and I have been working really hard to represent through this process, who all signed the easements because we feel like we need them and we did the work to get that done. So when you think about it as a microcosm, you got people on the top who have reasons for disagreeing, you got people on the bottoms who are taking matters into their own hands, and then you have the vast majority of the rest of them, which is why we've attempted to have conversations with the staff about looking for alternatives to the way the sector has been created because there are really three different um, items going on. We feel pretty strongly that the southern part of the sector and the middle part of the sector would come to an agreement on this if some things were tweaked. The northern, perhaps not. And we do understand that that's part of the current engineer engineering definition. We do understand that. But this brings me to my second point. We did not define the sector. You all did, right? We did not define the sector. So I hear at some points this incredible frustration that we don't have public access. Well, there are two public access points at the top and the bottom of the sector. And if the sector were defined as A and B, and I'm not suggesting that that's the answer, but then the public access would be closer. So I just don't understand why it seems like the constituents are being um, accused of, of something about us not having public access. Public access was defined by the sector. 
Um, so I, I just, just want to be clear about that. And these guys know I'm generally the good cop, but I found this very frustrating discussion. And, and it, it's also in relation to that, um, you know, the sector seems to be sacrosanct from the perspective of engineering, but then the sector is, there isn't public access? Well, there wasn't public access. Why have we been talking about this for two years? There is public access. I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, so um, the final thing I, I, I guess I'd like to state here is um, I was a little bit um, taken aback, as Jim uh, stated earlier, that there was this sort of option three <laughs> nuclear option to blow the whole project up. And I, again, I, I recognize the obstacles and frustration and the time that's been spent. It's, um, I've spent it too um, without getting paid for it. And um, I would just say, I, I guess it's clear that if in any case, and hopefully this isn't the option that's taken today, but if option three is taken, every one of those easements is nullified, right? I mean, that has to be part of the deal because if there's no, never was any public access and this is not a project that's viable, then, then they go back, okay? And that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak? I know this has been Good morning. Your name and address, please. Good morning. Doug DeMuth, uh, 1804 East Sandpoint, uh, uh, board member of uh, the uh, Sandpoint uh, Homeowners Association. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and keep this short. Um, the, I think one of the, when Lori and I went up and down the beach and talked to a number of these folks, um, you know, we, needless to say, many of them were, were, were very well to do. And... Uh, had significant legal backing and uh, uh, insight. Uh, and the, I think the majority of what we heard what came down to the easement issue and it, the in perpetuity nature of it. And you know, I, I'd ask that you think about you know, if you're in a position where the county comes to you and says, hey, by the way, uh, we want an in perpetuity easement to your property. Um, are you going to are you going to sign it? And let's you know if we're going to do that to these folks on the on the beach, let's do that to every homeowner in, in Indian River County. Make them sign an in perpetuity easement to their property, uh, not knowing what the county intends to do, driving Mack trucks across their yard or whatever else. It's just an in perpetuity generic in perpetuity easement. Let's make everybody in the county sign one of those things if we're going to do it to these folks on on the beach, and. Um, and that'd be fair. That'd be a fair way to look at this thing. Because that's what we're doing to these folks. And, ba and their lawyers are coming back and saying, you're crazy if you do this because you're basically granting your property rights away. You'll have no idea what they want to do, when they want to do it, and who's going to do it, and when they're going to do it. So uh, you know, we, we highly recommend that you don't do it. And that's what we're facing. And that, that, that's, that's the biggest hurdle that we face. And so if we can come up with some options here to, get, to modify this in perpetuity thing, I, what, uh, what we heard earlier, I think we can get some people to swing and possibly go over this hurdle and be able to, at the end of the day, write a nice article in 32963 saying, hey, the county, the, the community all got together. They had some, some challenges and they got over it and you know, guess what? We got we got beachfront property again, and I'll and I'll say one more thing too. I mean, when we talk about that particular sector, I mean, one of the things nice things about Vero, and I've heard this from so many people who are visitors to the area, is that if you want to, you can walk a nice long stretch of beach, with very few people there because you know it's just it's sparsely populated. It isn't commercial. It isn't overwhelming. You can walk a great stretch of beach and just enjoy yourself you're not it's not it's not uh, the new jersey coastline you know it's not it's not heavily populated i mean that's one of the nice things about vero beach uh that you you know you've got that access you can start to the northern end you can start it down around island you go north you can go south and you've got a great long stretch of just uh, of paradise and that's what Vero Beach, Beach brings to this. If we lose that, then I think we lose a lot in Vero Beach. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? 
Seeing none, commissioners? Yeah. Commissioner Flesher. Um, we, we've heard some great comments today. I want to appreciate the, the input. Um, uh, from the very onset, I uh, favored uh, option number two. Uh, no, I don't want to give up. And I don't believe it's a high cost factor of giving up, but one of the high cost factors of, uh, of uh, sticking with option two. But one of the, the higher cost factors is the future. So there would be a high cost factor if we didn't go with option two. But something that was brought up today was, well, could we make it different? Can we make the legal obligation different in the accessibility? And I, I think the public knows how long of a process it's been. Council, I think you can probably spend the next hour or so on a discussion on uh, how many turns it had to take to get to where we are and to get the rest of the beaches done. But if that's the case, and we've had that commitment in perpetuity for all the other sectors. I wanted the opportunity to ask the counselor, if we were to go in that mechanism of, or limitation of the uh, accessibility, the easement, and do it for a limited time, how would that impact the other easements, and would we have to go back, in all fairness, to go back to all the other easements and negotiate them and settle them so that everybody was on an equal and fair playing field? So, I, I, Commissioner, you've raised a, a significant point. Uh, legally, we could do a different beach easement for Sector 7. The issue then is for the 400 plus people who signed perpetual easements, uh, they're, they're all gonna come back in here um, and demand that they get the same deal that Sector 7 got and ask for you know, revocations, changes, amendments, and the like to their easements. Um, and, and it's just gonna be a backlash that I, I don't, that's just gonna come to us if we were to do something different for Sectors 3 and Sectors 5. Um, and, and those were beaches that had significantly more public access than sector seven certainly three so if that's the case uh how much would the the workload the effort the burden the cost to county to taxpayers to have to handle all of those renegotiations is it that, that, a significant that would be number? a lot of staff time if that's if that's the will of the board but that'd be a lot of staff time it'd be costs to re-record documents to re to record documents um, and then time and effort to work on that. The one other caution I do have is um, I heard uh, Mr. Field's presentation um, and it was the perpetual nature of the easement, but I heard Mr. DeMuth's presentation and there seemed to be an indication that there was a problem with the perpetual language, but also other language in the document. And I think certainly um, it, it would be much more problematic to do not just the perpetuity language, but then to change the other language individually negotiated with different property owners. Um, and I think going down that road is, is problematic. With that in mind, uh, and uh, thank you, Councilor. I wanted to uh, ask that before uh, I did go forward. But uh, with that in mind, I would like to go with option number two, and I make that motion to go could continue to go forward and direct staff to continue with the process. Cyrus. I'll second it. So um, I think option two is more to put things on hold and ask for extensions. That's correct. option one. Well, you mentioned to move the project forward. So that would be option one. So are you saying option two, put things on hold and ask for extensions, or are you no, saying move the project two, forward? Ask for extensions to move the project forward, because if we move the project forward in option one, then we were going to have pockets of inaccessibility, 
and it would be it would compromise the uh, entire process, the integrity of the sand distribution, and we would in actually encourage uh, continual erosion. All right. So just in my mind, how I hear it is option two is to put things on hold and wait a year and not move anything forward. So I'm just, I'm just clarifying that's what option two is, is to put everything on hold and ask for the extensions. That's correct. So yeah. staff would continue to move forward. Yes. Whatever. Wow. All right. We have a motion. Is there a second? Yes. I second. Mr. Moss. Is there any discussion? Yes. Commissioner Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Being the liaison again on the on the beach and shores, the the the, the question's always been brought up about the perpetuity. The the people that I have talked to on the beach uh, that have some have signed, some of your neighbors, uh, such as down on uh, you know Porpoise Point on Cavallo Road, stuff like that. I've talked to them. Uh, they they've all signed it. They're very familiar with what their neighbors issue. It, it, it does seem to be the the perpetuity language that that is the uh, that is the issue i have uh, talked to talked to staff about this a few times and and you know staff's always told me well everybody else signed it how what what you know we can't change it for just because everybody else has signed it um mr fields i'm like you i i think we th there's always a solution to an issue and it may cause more work on staff sometime and i would like staff to to further investigate it and see what what issues may arise from them but but i have i guess i look at this in in, in a different way in some cases that that perpetuity is strong things change people die their how they sell their houses all that sort of stuff um you know I won't be here if we, let's say we did one for 20 years, 30 years. I won't be here for 30 years. There'll be a new staff working on it, There'll be new people. I know that sounds maybe kind of kind of irrelevant, kind of childish, but but if it means coming a solution that make people happy to 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 eliminate the perpetuity and, and, and drop the numbers a little bit, I think once you do it, the first time you do it, the hard work is over with after that, is then it's just a matter of following up a form, just like all businesses send you now, because we're in the electronic world, you need to give permission to do this and do that, or they they, they come back with it uh, at a point in time later. Um, I have I do have an issue with with the perpetuity language, and I and I and I also could probably make a statement at another time for the uh, the hoteliers in town that didn't get sand. Uh, they had to sign that too of why they're having to sign it because they provide to our tourist development tax. They're one of the reasons people come here. So there's many reasons that I'm that I'm that, that I'm very uneasy for this, and and I would like to further discussion maybe <coughs> with staff in regards to the perpetuity. But, but I am like Commissioner Fleischer. I, I, I do support option two at this time with, with his uh, amendments made to it uh, to move ahead. But uh, it's just uh, really, really frustrating for me on both sides that we can't get the project done and in the, in the, in the perpetuity thing. And, and you also make a good argument for the sector redesign. Uh, you, there, there's a good argument for that too. And I, and I, and I would, you know, it, it, I would like staff to also look at that. Just just look at some other ideas. I, I've always tell them, and they, we got the best staff in the world. But I always tell them sometimes we need to think outside the box as long as it remains within the law. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll I'll be quiet from now on on that. And yep. That's where I stand, and, and I su I support uh, option two at this time. Any comments, uh, Commissioner's motion? Sure, I do. Um, and I always love hearing <clears throat> your comments. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. Um, my first comment is I, I share the frustration of and can empathize with a small portion of the community holding up initiatives supported by the larger portion of the community, especially in light of conversations that were had last week regarding initiatives supported by the larger part of the community that were not supported by the smaller part of the community. But in this case, you know, we are being asked to redefine public access, 
to redefine perpetuity. We're asking to create a special set of rules for this project that didn't apply to other projects. If we do road improvements or drainage improvements, and, and I think we have had discussions about MSBUs to do road improvements. I think we have a future discussion about an MSBU to do drainage improvements. We've done, um, we've done uh, road improvements where we require, all these improvements require people to give us an easement so we can go on their property and do improvements. Those easements are very similar to these easements and there is no difference in dumping sand on a dirt road than there is dumping sand on the beach. So I don't see why if we are going to give an, an exception to this type of project, we could, wouldn't give an exception to other types of projects because that's the next thing that's going to happen. You're going to have people on Community Road in Felsmer saying, well, technically this is a private road. We've allowed you to come on and do this, and now we don't want you to. Or we want you to come back every 25 or 50 years and, or two years or five years or whatever the number is and ask for the ability to continue to maintain the road when the neighbors have depended upon the county's ability to maintain the road. So I don't really see why we would be giving a buy to beach projects when we're not giving the same um, exception to road projects or drainage projects. <clears throat> At the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to support option two. I do agree with Commissioner O'Brien's comments, but Option two is not up to us at this point to determine if the project moves forward. Option two is, let, is asking FEMA if it is okay for us to put it on hold and move forward. So it's not my decision. That would be FEMA's decision. And we can see what FEMA says, and then we can come back and have a conversation. But you know, it, at some point, enough is enough, and at some point, accept, and putting things off and putting things off, at the end of the day, if we continue to put things off and, and not make a decision one way or another, by the time the project moves forward, we'll be spending twice as much money because construction costs will go up and sand costs will go up, and the way de the development is happening right now, upland sand sources are being used for multiple other projects, so the dollars are coming up. And dredging has always been extremely expensive, which is why the county moved to Upland Sand Sources multiple years ago. So, you know, I'm happy to support this today, but I guess my point is we cannot keep kicking the can down the road because we don't want to make a decision. And at some point, whether we make the decision or FEMA makes a decision, that's what it's going to be. So we can just accept that and move on. Thank you. Commissioner Moss, any comments? Well, um, it's interesting to me because uh, years ago, uh, the county came to the city of Vero Beach uh, for the city council uh, to vote on this, on the language, and in perpetuity uh, was the language at that time, and uh, I voted against it. Uh, so this was, you know, this in perpetuity has been around for years, and uh, I've been against it for years. Thank you. So um, just a couple comments. One, a couple of the speakers mentioned that there is public access. So I'm looking at the aerial map here, and I'm thinking, okay, if I get in my truck and load up my chair and my cooler and I drive over the bridge and I head south on A1A, where in Sector 7 would I pull in where I could park get my stuff out of the truck, and walk onto the beach. And I don't see anywhere in Sector 7 where I can do that. That's how I define public access, is that the general public, not just neighbors living next to the neighbor who owns the house on the beach, says, yeah, uh, Joe, anytime you want, you can just walk through my backyard, get to the beach. I'm talking about true public access, and I see no public access in Sector 7. Another comment was made that, well, if you want the beachfront owners to sign these easements, you should make everybody else. And I'll tell you, um, we already have all those easements, okay? We have drainage easements, we have utility easements, we have access easements, and those are 
in perpetuity. They are recorded on the deed and they can't be changed. So, and we can go on to those properties without notice. You know, if we need to clean a ditch or uh, the AT&T guy needs to run a line, they, they have access. They have that easement in place. And so we have those in place. We have done it to everybody else. We're not picking on the, uh, the uh, beach folk people. And then finally, there are other creative ways to do this other than us changing the standards we've set. Um, if some of these property owners don't want to sign the easement, we will be glad uh, if they want to privately pay for the sand that goes in front of their, their home, and then we can do the rest of the project with the folks that um, have signed the easements. And that way they can put their money in they don't have to sign the easement because we're not putting public resources on private property. So I would throw that out there as a solution. Um, if we want to get this done and people don't want to sign the easement, say, okay, well, and, and we'll be glad to give them the, the price per cubic yard and how many cubic yards you're going to get, and then they can pay for that, and then we can move forward. Um, but short of that, I, again, to me, this project is... is Sector 7 was, was started after the 04 hurricanes, before I was on board, but I remember hearing from a lot of people back then while it was going on that, hey, you know, I can't, why are we doing this? Because it's all private property. And I feel the same way now. Um, I don't see any public access. And so I, 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 the last time this came to us, I also said I, I feel sorry for the people that have signed the easements, but you know, we're, we're obligated to do these things a certain way. Um, I don't believe in changing our standards midstream just for one area. And then um, it was also mentioned that only 1.8% of the population is holding this whole thing up. Well, um, it's really, Rich, what do we got, 82 property owners? Yes, sir. And so... Um, based on the easements of the 82 property owners, 33% of the oceanfront property owners are the ones that are, are not letting this go forward, not 1.8%. And if we really want to crunch numbers, then I can take those same 3,000 people and say they're only 1.8% of the total county population of 160,000. So you want us to change our standards, use taxpayer dollars, for 1.8% of the, of the population. So um, I, I'm still opposed uh, to moving this forward. I think we've beat this thing to death. And so with that, we have a motion by Commissioner Fletcher, second by Commissioner Moss. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. That motion carries four to one with Commissioner O'Brien opposed. All right, moving on to county attorney matters. Uh, commissioners, we have, um, I think, Mayor Brackett and City Manager Falls have probably had enough of uh, watching our county meeting, although I'm sure they're very impressed and excited and uh, glad that they've been here for three hours. But um, if you all uh, don't mind, I'd like to go ahead and move up item 13C, the Chapter 164 mediation update, and take that first. Um, instead of uh, after the other items, so they if there's no to make us sit through the city council meeting, <laughs> well, uh, I'm hoping they'll remember. So, um, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and do uh, Dylan the uh, Chapter 164 mediation update. Thank you very much. On January 25th, 2022, Jason Brown and I attended a mediation as part of the Chapter 164 dispute resolution process initiated by the City of Vero Beach. At the end of the mediation, uh, City of Vero Beach City Manager said that the city would put together the city's conditions on what it would take for the shores to be served by the county. City Manager did note that they were still anticipating the feasibility study to be released, and thus the City Manager had asked the county to relay to the city if the town was still interested in being served by the county after the feasibility study was released. So the feasibility study has been released. Um, and the city was uh, going to hire a consultant at their last council meeting and to determine whether they were going to figure out how what their stranded costs would be if the Shores customers left. Uh, but the city council tabled that item, waiting for that additional information from the county. 
So now, just want to make it very clear and very public, I can say that after the release of the feasibility study, the town is still interested in exploring all of its options, and that does include being served by the county after its franchise agreement expires. So the town has said they're still wanting to move forward with understanding all of its options, including the, being served by the county. And I hope this answers the question for the city um, so that they can move forward with whatever decisions they need to make in order to prepare the conditions. And with that, I'm available for questions. Commissioners, any questions of Dylan? Seeing none, uh, Mayor or Monty, would either of you like to speak? Unfortunately, Mayor, I have to say good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, that answers the question. We, we tabled it. We didn't want to go ahead forward and spend $30,000 of taxpayer money until uh, we got the answer back because the feasibility study had not been issued at the time of our last meeting. So that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you all for Mayor. staying so long. Um, <laughs> is that your poker face there? <laughs> Oh, Net Netflix is down. Yeah. Okay. So now we go back under county attorney matters. Item 13A, sale of a 0 .07 acre parcel of land on Old Dixie Highway to MJMC-2 LLC. Mr. DeBraw, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Bill DeBraw on behalf of the county attorney's office. If you take a look at uh, your screens, you'll be able to see this triangular shaped 0 0.07 acres of property that the county acquired via tax deed. It's part of the old SB subdivision uh, that's there. It's an unbuildable lot. The county has no use for it. We were approached by uh, the folks uh, led by Mr. Jan Yellenby. Um, that would be WHPG and also MJMC-2. If you move to the east of this property where it says SB subdivision, they own those two lots. They want to develop them uh, for automobile uh, housing, kind of a work area type of, of thing that seems to be in vogue these days. Um, and they would like to have their entrance and, and, and uh, exit through the very top of involve, uh, the county releasing its, a or, or, which would involve the county selling the 0 .07 acres. Um, the middle strip, if you go to the east of the triangle, is right of way. That was platted with the SB subdivision. They have applied to abandon that right of way. And so then if the board goes along with the sale of the triangle part applicants, the value of the property that's commercial industrial here is $1,500. It's staff's recommendation that the board consider the sale of the triangle parcel for $1,500 as it's not a needed necessary parcel of property. I'll answer any questions you might have. Commissioners, any questions of staff? Other methods into enforcing our code enforcement liens, and one of those being foreclosure. Um, after doing so and meeting with staff um, and seeing different cases that we have had issues with, you know, been on going code enforcement liens for numerous years, there's a couple cases we'd like to start with, and this is what we're looking forward to being just the beginning of some cases coming forward. Now these cases were brought in front of the Code Enforcement Board on Monday, February 28th. The Code Enforcement Board has already granted an order for each one of these cases for us to move forward with the foreclosure proceedings pursuant to chap Florida Chapter 162.09, subsection 3. And under that section of the Florida statute, it states that we have to have authorization from the sorry, the Code Enforcement Board in order for us, the County Attorney's Office, to move forward with any foreclosure proceedings pursuant to any liens on property for code enforcement. So today we have three separate cases that we are asking that you, as the Board of County Commissioners, authorize us to continue to move forward with foreclosure proceedings. Um, I would ask that if I could just call each of them individually. I know it's one item, but there's a couple people here on each of those properties, I believe. So I will go ahead and start with the case number 2018 020108, that's the code enforcement case number, and that's for the Yates property. 
Um, and this case started an action back in 2018 with a complaint regarding a system and disrepair, as well as unsecured vacant structures. Um, the case is still open in the fact that there's still a daily fine of $100 per day still running. Um, there's currently a recorded lien at OR book 3117, page 2458, for a violation against this property for for that. Um, since that time frame, this case was also brought back in front of the Environmental Control Hearing Board. Um, and we were notified in front of that board that the structure had actually, one of the structures on the property had actually suffered a fire and left half of that structure burnt down. Um, so this particular property, I'm not sure if you all recall, I guess a couple years ago, some of you may recall, Back in 2018, um, the board was asked for permission to file an injunction. The county went, you know, county staff volunteered their time. They went onto the property. It was cleaned up, and then a lien was placed on the property, and um, for I think roughly 10 to maybe 11 thousand um, dollars. And that's apart from that was through environmental. That's apart from the code enforcement liens. Um, there is also currently another environmental lien running on there. Once again, that's separate and apart from the code enforcement lien. Um, a daily lien as well, uh, running up $200 a day. Um, but we are proceeding under code enforcement um, and the Florida statutes for the foreclosure proceedings. So I do believe I saw the um, personal representative for the estate who owns that property, and there are several properties in that um, estate that we could look to foreclose upon. Um, she is here, Miss Yates. So I'm not sure if the commissioners has any questions of me before... I see if she wants it. I just have one because Yates seems to ring a bell with me. Didn't a representative of the estate come to us maybe a year or two ago and wanted some more time to do the improvements? Does that ring a bell with anybody? Or? I, I don't recall no? okay. that. Um, I know that she's recently, the estate was recently open this past year, so it wasn't open that long ago. Um, and she has asked, you know, for time in front of, you know, code enforcement and environmental to okay. to fix things. But she is here today, and can she can speak to that? Okay. Uh, any commissions or questions of staff? Okay. She would like to come on up. Okay. Thank you. All. Good afternoon. Welcome. If you could give your uh, name and address, please. Thank you. I'm Dallas Steen Yates. My address is 3810 45th Welcome. Street, Vero Beach. 32967. And what would you like to say to us? Well, first, I'd like to say that I have retained new counsel uh, for probate of the estate, a new attorney, Attorney Fran Ross. She uh, is in court today, and um, of course, she only became aware, and I only became aware of this event uh, last week. Uh, in fact, I wasn't noticed about it. We came down. <laughs> to the county to inquire more about what was to happen next after the hearing on Monday. And that is how we found out that this would happen. She already had a case slated to go to trial today in Fort Pierce, and so that's where she is. However, also um, in the interim of last week, I was able to get folk to help me bring the property in compliance. All of the buildings are boarded up. Most of them were boarded up. There were a few windows that had not, weren't boarded. And the grounds have been cleaned. I've sent pictures, I emailed them to the county yesterday. And so um, showing the state of the properties that are the trigger for this foreclosure proceeding. So. It's in compliance. The building that burned, uh, it's going through the permitting process right now so that it can be demolished. So the, the issue before the county in terms of the buildings not being compliant has been resolved. Secondly, regarding the lien and the fines, um, I'm also, my conditions have changed. Uh, I have family member who is working with me and is well able to pay the lien and whatever fines we, in settlement, we can negotiate on the fines. Um, we are here to cooperate and pay that so that we don't have to take the drastic measure 
of foreclosing on my whole family's estate because of a $10,000 fine, a, a lien, and then fines that have been running. Uh, so that, that's my position on that and uh, just you know, would appreciate the commission uh, understanding and we're ready within the next 30 to 60 days to pay that. So whatever the county is owed, uh, we're ready to pay that. I had approached the county last week as well. Actually, at the beginning of February, I had a closing date on a separate piece of property in the estate that's not a part of what was out of compliance. I had a closing to sell it. The title company contacted uh, the county uh, department and asked for partial release so I could sell that property and have the money to take care of what needs to happen. Again, this is a state property. Um, and of course, uh, the county would not, I sent a letter to the county attorney saying we've got a closing date, buyer at the table, we're ready to sell it and give you what we owe you. And uh, the county uh, believed that the proceeds from that sale would not be enough. I don't agree with that because at least it, even if it hadn't been totally what they wanted, it's well more than the 10 plus what the fines were if we could negotiate the fines. And I, I've seen the county negotiating with everybody else down to 10%. So my calculation said, yeah, there'd be enough, but they didn't agree with allowing the partial release of the lien on a separate property in the estate so that I could settle the matter with the county. Um, and again, this is my family's property. It's been my father. Most, many of you would have known him. He was the first black law enforcement officer, deputy sheriff in Indian River County in 1962. And those who knew him and know him uh, personally and just as a public servant, my mom taught school for almost 40 years at Clemens Elementary, at Douglas and Wabasso, educated many, I'm sure, parts of your family. My father provided low-income housing in uh, Indian River County, those rental properties, since the 50s. And I often say to people, he was Section 8 before there was Section 8. <laughs> And so he was never in it. The properties were low income. There wasn't that kind of money coming in from the estate uh, of, or from the rentals. It kept the buildings up. It kept the pack taxes paid. But there was no great wealth generated from those properties. So he died at age 96. And any of you who knew him, he was in charge. And so. Uh, he, he made his decisions about how he would, and, and God blessed him that way uh, to, to serve and to help others. And so upon his passing, I was a minister. I still am. I was employed full time as a minister in small towns, Pahokee, Clewiston, Okeechobee. I don't make money, but that's the sacrifice I made with my life to help others. So I didn't have my personal resources to go in and maintain the properties. And uh, so I finally retired. 2019 turned my attention to this, was able to become appointed representative of the estate. And so here we are. I've been trying to sell property since last year. It was exactly this month, March last year, that I was appointed personal representative. And I've been trying to sell property, finally got a serious buyer at the table on one. I was, had multiple properties up for sale. Finally was ready to go on February 14th, and the county chose to push it to the Code Enforcement Board hearing of February 28th to okay. move to foreclose. Thank you, Ms. Yates. Um, Susan, can we confirm that the property is in compliance now? I cannot confirm anything. I have not received any emails. I am looking at county staff that are sitting here in the back, and I am indicating that no one from code enforcement has received an email. Um, so we cannot make any sort of confirming statements that it's currently sitting in compliance. Um, I also would need to ask staff about compliance now that one of the buildings has actually been burned. So I'm not sure what compliance would even look like with that. 
speak to that. I have my confirmation from Anna Anglin that the emails were received. I sent them out after, I took pictures after everything was finally completed. Most work was done Saturday. The last boards went up yesterday afternoon. I took pictures. Anna Anglin has confirmed <coughs> receipt of those uh, pictures that I sent. And again, I have them in my sure. phone uh, to show. And as far as the burn building compliance is, the notice that I have from the building division is that a permit needed to be pulled and then the works the work commenced within a certain period of time so we're within that time frame that, did you receive the permit they it's in the permitting they pulled the permit mat last week so that's they are the building that building just burned at the end of november and i got my first notice from uh the building division january okay it, if I may add yep. one thing, Ms. Yates, you, you did mention your attorney, uh, I believe it was Fran Ross. Yes. Um, and I know you said she couldn't be here today. She was, wanted a continuance, yep. actually. I forgot to say that. I, I want you to be aware that Ms. Ross reached out to Ms. Prado, I believe, on Tuesday last week, right. and she asked to speak to the county attorney. I left her a message on Tuesday. I have not heard back from Ms. Ross since then. You left Ms. Ross a message? Yes, I left your attorney a message on Tuesday last week, and I have not received a response phone call since then. I'll ask her about that, but she has not mentioned that to me. And she said that, um, well, I was actually standing next to her when you guys called her back. I think it was Susan that called her and said that uh, there's a hearing, because when we met with the chief of the code enforcement board, we went in her office, I think it's Rebecca, not sure, but we met with her and she said, we were trying to find out what's the next step, what's gonna happen next, and she said, oh, you've got plenty of time, there are 30 days, there's this, and when we left the building, um, she got a call and I think it was I thought it was this attorney, Susan, that called her and said that, well, there is a hearing, not, there's a meeting on the 8th. And uh, attorney Ross looked at her calendar and said, hold on, let me look at my calendar. She says, I'm starting a trial on Tuesday. And um, she said, well, that it was not a hearing and so attorney Ross said, well, can Ms. Yates be there? And she said, yeah, she can be there. So I came in here really not even knowing that I could be heard. Okay. Um, commissioners. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Vice Chairman uh, Ehrman. Thank you. Is this, is this the property of your mom and dad's house, of y'all's house that you grew up in right there? Or is this, is this the property that's in question, the house? The house right that I grew up in? Right there on 45th? It, now, the way that I understand it for probate purposes, it's exempt property. So I don't know if that's something that the county is including and in trying to foreclose on or not. But it would be if that's not treated as exempt property. Is, is the septic tank been brought into compliance? Do we know? If I may. So the problem is, is there's multiple different properties. So All in the same area or different locations? There's a few different properties scattered around, I believe, the, the North County Gifford area, I believe. Um, there's one on 45th. There's another one on 37th. There's another two on 42nd or 32nd. And then there's the properties in question, which the violation was in. Now, these are all properties of the estate. The properties in violation are off of 68th, I believe, and there's three. There's three different buildings there. They don't appear to be a homestead. It appears to be what I believe is an old church and also a couple of duplexes, which is they used to rent out. And no, the septic tanks were forced to be abandoned because they could not be repaired, um, from my understanding, from the health department. And the tenants that were there were asked to leave because there was nothing they could do to fix it to make it sanitary for them to live. Okay. Um so, so, so it's different properties located throughout. I mean, if any, I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear actually more from staff under where this is because, uh, Ms. Yates, I think this is 
been since 2018. We, we've dealt with this. We've continued to deal, we've continued to deal with this, and I appreciate your effort to try to do it. If you have a solution in the next 30 days, I'd be willing to give you 30 days, but we can't continue to say, you know, I'm working on it, I'm doing it, I'm trying to get it done. It's, it's either got to be done there's, or not. I mean, there comes a point in, there becomes a point in time. If you have some property sold and, you, and, and, and staff can negotiate with you a, a settlement, I, I'm okay with that too. But my, my point is, is that, uh, you know, yes, I, I've known your family for, for many, many years. I, I remember your, your mom and dad very well, but we have to, uh, we have to follow the law. If I may, commissioners, mm -hmm. I apologize. I just want to clarify some of um, the procedural things I think that Ms. Yates has alluded to um, when she talked about, you know, staff denying a lien release and staff denying certain things. <coughs> this, she requested a partial lien release on one property that she did, you know, ask about there being a sale. I did hear from a title agent. I informed the title agent, as I do on any other lien property, you know, that they would have to have it set in front of the code enforcement board to ask for a partial lien release. The code enforcement board did hear this partial lien release request on February 28th. Staff was not in agreement with the partial lien release, which we are allowed to make a recommendation. And the code enforcement board is the one that makes the final decision on whether or not they're releasing that lien or not. So I just want to clarify that, that that's not something that is a staff decision. Because I keep hearing staff makes the decision. I've negotiated with staff. and. Um, also to clarify, Ms. England is from the health department. So I believe where she sent it was the health department, not code enforcement. So, and even then Ms. England would not be able to verify. She's just the receiving person secretary. Someone would still have to go and verify that the property is in compliance. So, so Commissioner Ehrman, did you want to make a motion or? Conversation. Huh? Go, go, ahead, go ahead, I want to hear some more conversation. Does anyone else, Susan? I, 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 Adams, <clears throat> I would be willing to allow staff until the next meeting of this board, which is next Tuesday, a week to verify that things were in compliance. And then we can, I just think extending it 30 days, you know, we've, we've, it's been extended and extended and extended. And I think that there might be some confusion as to who you need to to give the information to so things can be verified. So I think seven days would give you guys in code enforcement the time to see if the, prop, the proper property, I think that's the other confusing point, is there seems to be multiple properties, so which property is supposed to be fixed up? It's At least it seems confusing across the board here. So. If you guys want to give an extension, for me, I think seven days gives staff the time to see if anything has happened. Because if nothing has happened until this point, I don't think anything is going to happen for 30, in 30 days. So I don't know if that's a possibility, but that's more of where I would rather be than 30 days from now. So just one clarification, Ms. Yates. Um, the burn building, have you applied for the permit to demo that? Yes. And so that's in our building department? Yes. Okay. Well, but, it, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You have that information? Mr. McAdam. Good afternoon, Scott. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Scott McAdam, building official. Unfortunately, I was just called down here at the last minute. I can't confirm if that is in our department for an application or not. I mean, I can run over there and run back real quick. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Adams, one thing, you know, if you're making a motion for seven we days, do it. Um, I would just say um, it, it may take building department more than seven days to process an application. I'm not worried about the application so much. Okay. I mean, if they can confirm that it's in process, okay. All right. then I, then okay. I trust that. My, okay. my bigger concern, and I don't even know if it's possible to, to punt it for seven days is if there's pictures that indicate that the property has been attempted to clean up in some manner and they were sent to the wrong person I I want to at least give the option of confirming whether that has happened or not I mean honestly 
if this meeting goes on, the way this meeting is going, you could probably run out there and find out and come back and tell us and we'll still be here. But, um, you know. It's all the vice chairman's <laughs> fault, really. I'm just, I, you know, I, I do, and I know I've been one of the commissioners that has encouraged staff to move forward with the foreclosure process. So I say this because at some point you can't just let fines and fines go on, but I am cognizant of the fact that what the foreclosure process means is that we are, are no, no. So your, your uh, motion is, would be to continue for seven days, yeah, I'd be happy to verify the compliance and verify that the permit has been submitted and is being processed. Correct. Second. Okay. Is Dylan, we can legally do that? I mean, yeah, and, and so the way I envision this happening is because of our technical granicus process and making sure agenda items get filed, what we will do is we will have an item, and depending on the next two items, but what I envision is there will literally be a cut and paste of the Yates portion of this memo. It'll be put right back in granicus, and literally there'll be an extra sentence that'll say, and staff will provide an update on the various issues that were addressed during the March 8th meeting. Thus, we may not, we're not gonna have time to put that into Granicus, but we'll be able to have time at Tuesday's meeting next week to say, this is what we've discovered with regards to the building permit status, the status of the property and the like. Does that, is that what the board's looking for? Yes. Yes. Perfect. And Susan, are you okay? Does that make sense? That Real brief. makes sense. Okay, Real great. Brief. That's kind of maybe where I was thinking when I stopped talking about this because, because I wasn't familiar with this. That's why I asked what property it actually was. I didn't know there were multiple properties. I was assuming by reading this, this was a single property, and it, and it, you know it should be easier to bring in compliance. But yeah, if there's multiple properties, then there's multiple research to be done, which which you all in the code enforcement board have already have already done. So so yeah, I, I I just need a little more information. I'd be in favor of that, and it'll give you time to get with the right people. I'd like to clarify regarding the language, multiple properties. The property out of compliance is taxed as one address. It's located in Wabasso, and the building numbers are 8835 through 8889. There are a couple of duplexes. Mm -hmm. There was a vacant lot in between. There's the house 8845 that burned this past November. And there's the first building, 8835. It's all one stretch, it's 1.7 acres. The multiple things are the other properties in the estate. They are not out of compliance, they're not at issue. It's, but because it's a state property, you know, it's all a part of the estate. So, but the problem is with the Wabasso pro property, that's it. And, and Commissioner, to follow up on that, basically under, our process, um, and Susan will certainly correct me when I get off base, is we have a piece of property that someone owns that has a code enforcement lien or the like. It attaches to all of their property. And so what we're looking at doing is part of this is basically we now have the right to go foreclose on other pieces of property in order to recover the money that we had because of the one piece of property. And Susan, is that what you were looking for? That's correct. So what I was looking for was for the authorization to move forward to foreclose on any property that is owned under the estate, obviously with the exception of something that is homestead, but um, any other property that our lien would touch, we could foreclose on. Okay. Could we, could we solve this by next meeting? Well, I don't know if we can get the answer, but uh, as I said, what, what our goal is to file the agenda item such that we will have until Tuesday to be so essentially report back to you in whatever information we have. And if that means we can send an email out to you Friday afternoon or Monday in advance, we will certainly do so. Perfect. Mm -hmm. An update from Scott? Yes. Yeah, for the address where the fire was, 8845 64th Avenue, we don't have a permit application for a demolition. Hmm. The person who did the cleanup work and brought the, did the overgrowth, they were also doing the demo and said that they were going to pull the permit, that's the language they used, and that they had started that last week. But they haven't turned anything in then apparently. So I don't know. It sounds like you're going to have to take it into your own hands. <laughs> 
I don't mind doing it at all. I, I okay, don't know so Ms. Yates, we're, we're going to give you a seven-day reprieve here, but there's a lot of things you need to do, okay? You need, whoever's doing the clearing, you need to get a hold of them, make sure that they have submitted the permit. Um, we'll have code come check the property, see if it's in compliance. I would strongly urge you to have your attorney contact the county attorney's office, and you've got seven days to do that, because I'll, I'll support this motion now, but next week, I'll probably vote to go ahead and move forward with foreclosure. So the ball's in your court, so to speak, and those are things you need to get done, okay? All right. Okay, thank you. All right, so commissioners, any further discussion? Susan, you're, you're clear with everything? With this one, and so are you voting on just Ms. This, this is just the, uh, the, the Yates. I just want to make yeah. sure, thank yeah. you. Yeah, just for the Yates. All right, so we have the motion. Um, Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor, signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that carries 5-0. So, Ms. Yates, you have seven days, okay? All right. And if somebody can give me the correct email address, I was told that that Z-Box address went to all the departments in the county. Okay. <laughs> so, um, it only goes to environmental health. All right. Maybe Kelly right behind you can, can help you with that, or, okay. or Kelly, if you could. Yeah. And then... Ms. Corals, those ladies back there can help you, or that guy in that blue shirt over there. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to, thank you, Ms. Yates. Appreciate you coming here. Um, so now, Susan, this is case number 2017-080035 Palmer on 14th Avenue. Yes, and good afternoon again, commissioners. Um, this particular case is regarding a code enforcement matter that started back in 2017 regarding a complaint of junk vehicles, trash debris, construction equipment storage and a dilapidated fence. There was an evidentiary hearing held January 22nd, 2018, where the respondents, Michael S. Palmer and Kelly L. Palmer, were found in violation of the Indian River County Code. They were later given a time frame to correct, failed to correct, and the property was fined $100 per day with an order recorded at OR Book 3109, page 1500. That property was never brought into compliance. And I'm sure the board will remember that a few months ago, September, yeah. maybe August, um, I was standing here in front of the board asking for a sister property to the same exact property owner on 15th Avenue. And that particular property had been declared a public nuisance and we were asking permission from this board to go onto that property to clean it up. Since then, we have hired contractors. That property had been cleaned up. However, in that cleanup process, the 14th Avenue property actually became worse and got more junk trash and debris as the property owner was hauling stuff from the 15th Avenue property and scurrying it over to the 14th Avenue property. Um, and since then, we've had numerous complaints, you know, from neighbors about the worsening situation. Um, so at this point in time, we're seeking, since the 14th Avenue property is not a homestead property, to move forward with foreclosure on that property. Um, and that way we can recoup the $20,000 in cost that we've spent cleaning up the other property um, and hopefully recoup our fine amount that we've had there, which has been running since 2017. Okay, any questions of staff? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. I have Commissioner Adams first. Oh, I was just gonna make a motion. Oh, you do it. What is? I, I'll go ahead I do and have a question. question. What, what is happening on the homestead of property? Has it gotten any, is it still in bad shape? Well, since then he's now transferring stuff from the 14th Avenue property back to the homestead property. So the homestead I actually have it set for a hearing in front of Judge Croom for a contempt order. So that's- um, Goodness gracious. It's a whole nother issue. Okay. This is only well, 50 sure it'll come back then. I, I make a motion to move forward with foreclosure. Second. Okay. Is there anyone here that wanted to speak on this one? I do not see the uh, owner's presence. Okay. Um, on motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Flesher to move forward with foreclosure. All in favor signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Now case number 2017-04-0072, Family Dollar. Susan, again. Thank you again, Commissioner. Um, so summer of 2017, the code enforcement staff received a complaint regarding a site plan nonconformance violations, landscape maintenance violations, and junk trash and debris. There was an evidentiary hearing held June 26, 2017. The respondents, Belmont Equities and Family Dollar, were found in violation of the Indian River County Code. 
They were given a time to correct the violation. It was not done so, and a fine amount of $100 per day was ordered, and that is recorded in Book 3081, page 1500. The property was not brought into compliance, and it's since then, throughout the years, accumulated junk, trash, and debris that seemed to wax and wane. Um, there are, I know there are a couple representatives here today. I did receive a couple of photographs from this morning from the representative showing that the trash and stuff appears to be clean, but there are still the other outstanding issues of the landscape maintenance violations. Um, they have a site plan that for landscape and landscape maintenance that they currently are not in compliance with. So that has also, information has also been forwarded to the um, representatives here, so they are aware of that. Um, at this point in time, we are seeking to move forward with foreclosure. Um, I understand that maybe they are going to ask for some time to work on this and to come into compliance. Um, we're still asking to move forward with the process um, of foreclosure, given the understanding and after speaking to the council for Family Dollar, um, letting her know that that process isn't something that's gonna to happen tomorrow. Foreclosure won't necessarily be filed tomorrow. It would just keep us moving forward without having to come back here again for another hearing or having her to have to drive again from, I believe she's coming from Tampa to come back over here for another thing. Um, but that's what staff is asking for today. Um, and if you have any questions. Um, Susan, I, I get what you're saying that we could start the process, but maybe you know we don't actually go to foreclosure court for a while. About how long do you estimate that window would be? I had given probably between 30 and 60 days because we hired outside counsel. So we have to gather the documentation for outside counsel. We have to send it over to them. They have to prepare whatever they prepare, send out the notices, and then move forward that way. So it would still be a little while. That was a discussion I did have with outside counsel, and they said that they obviously, some people will, once they've received those notices for foreclosure, want to come forward and start working with us, and that's fine. We'll be more than happy to work to resolve whatever we need to resolve. But at this point in time, that's why I was simply asking that if we could continue to move forward since nothing is yet filed and it will probably be some time before something is filed. Right, and we can always, if they do come in full compliance, we can just stop it. Correct. Okay, all right. Commissioners, any questions or anything for staff? Somebody Does anybody want to make a motion? About the delay because this is a property that, uh, and an organization that we worked with extensively to uh, ensure that uh, it moved forward. Uh, on the very inception is the, the, the drainage and uh, a lot of exceptions and uh, uh, county work had to be done to ensure that the establishment uh, moved forward and uh, then to know that uh, there's a continual rejection for non-compliance uh, without any request for uh, understanding or have to move forward so move forward with staff's request okay yes motion to proceed with foreclosure we have a second is there anyone that wishes to speak on this good afternoon if you could give your name and address for the record please Good afternoon, Kate Cooper here on behalf of Family Dollar. My office is 6921 Pistol Range Road. It is up in Tampa. Um, I have brought with me today um, Mr. Valak. He is our local district manager to sort of discuss what's going on with this Family Dollar property, um, if the commission is so inclined to hear some of our, our thoughts and our solutions today. Sure. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, just a little bit of background. This was a, a case that began back in 2017. I went back and looked at the minutes from the June 26th meeting where the fine was imposed. It doesn't look like anyone appeared on behalf of either the property owner or the tenant family dollar. Um, we're gonna have to look at that internally in terms of like notice and, and whatnot. But I can tell the board that um, I sort of act as a conduit if there's any type of code issues that come up here um, in Florida with um, the headquarters up north in, in Chesapeake. Um, to sort of see what's going on and how can we resolve this. I can tell the board that um, we first received notice that this was sort of occurring um, approximately three weeks ago from the landowner who sent us notice. Um, reached out to the county, attended the hearing last week requesting an extension of about 60 days to get this addressed. Um, it was an issue of trash and debris accumulating in the parking lot. 
um, as well as landscaping that didn't adhere to the site plan. Um, since that time, and, and what I can tell you is this particular store is relatively new. Do you know what year it was built? I do not. Okay, I believe it was built within the past the last five, five years. years. Mm -hmm. And in that time, um, we just completed an internal uh, renovation of the store. We added coolers, freezers. Um, we are, we've remained an essential business throughout COVID. We've kept our doors <laughs> open. Um, we provide food and resources to low-income members of the community. Um, and do so with very thin margins. Not an excuse, but it is sort of something that we're addressing. Um, and within the time that we found out about it, um, that this was sort of going into effect, um, we removed, there was a large waste um, dumpster that had been on the property for too long um, because of the renovation that had been brought in, and that was some of the accumulation of the trash. Within a week since this last hearing that we had before the code board, that's been removed. Um, we've, um, and Mr. Vallett can uh, testify as to some of the additional things that we're doing to get the property in compliance in terms of getting cardboard removed, getting the trash removed. I did send photographs. I went to the property both last week before the code hearing and this week before today's hearing, took photographs. The parking lot is immaculate. There's no trash anywhere in the parking lot. Um, I will tell the board that there's some debris within the landscaping. Um, but we've retained two different contractors to get proposals to comply with the site plan. I requested the site plan from the county. They provided it to us after uh, last week's hearing. Um, we are waiting for the bids from those two contractors um, to get the landscaping in compliance. I will tell you that they did say that there's approximately 800 plants that would need to be ordered um, and would be part of that um, Right, the site, development. the site development plan. Um, in terms of logistics and how quickly we can get those in there, I think that would be an issue. Um, so for day, uh, you know, our purposes is we're asking for 60 days to come into compliance. I believe this is our first request for any type of extension because this is sort of the first time that we've really been brought in to get this resolved. Um, and we are trying to work with the community and the county to get this property fixed up. So, um, what I would suggest then, um, I think the board, based on the motion, is looking forward to give staff uh, uh, authorization to move forward. Um, what I would suggest is maybe you come back to us, appear before the board in 30 days and update us where you are um, and you know, bring in invoices where you've shown you've ordered the plants, um, you know, things like that to document that there is progress um, going forward and then we can uh, discuss it again at that point. Would the board be willing to move to amend the current motion to allow that 30 days? I, I think from what Susan said, nothing's gonna happen for 30 days or up to 60, so um, we could probably slow it down to allow for the 30 days, Susan, would that work? I mean, that, that's fine. Like I said, I still need to gather documents to get it to outside counsel. I don't know what workload outside counsel has or how long it would take them to file stuff, but it would it would still take a while, I imagine. And okay. Dylan may have something else to say on that. Yeah, I'm just, again, this is the first time we're doing these, so we're all trying to figure them out, so I, I appreciate the thought process. Um, what I'm hearing is start to work with outside counsel and prepare documents and be ready to file. We will bring, as a county attorney's office, an item on April 12th. Um, it basically says this is an update to the board we're not going to we're going to tee it, tee it up for Ms. Cooper to then make her presentation as to where she is and then we'll be seeking for additional guidance from this board before we file anything is that what the board's thinking yes okay and what I would respond very briefly is that I, I do think that we could save sort of the staff's time and energy um, in moving that forward if we're just going to be compliant within hopefully 30 days it, my, my fear is that we're going to come back in 30 days and say look we have the proposal we have everything in we're just waiting for some final part of irrigation. Meanwhile, they've moved forward within those 30 days on a foreclosure process that we're within inches of being compliant on. So we're well, I think I just I appreciate your concern, but I think we're a fairly reasonable group here. And if you come back in 30 days and have good, secure documentation, invoices, work orders, things like that that show progress, um, I don't think it's our intent that we want to really slam down and foreclose on family dollar, but we do want to see progress and be moving in the right direction. So um, 
I, I think giving you 30 days is going to be good. And, you know, again, be up to you all to document that you are making progress. Okay. Do we, may I ask a question? Do, do we really have a guarantee, though, that nothing will happen within 30 days? Well, legally, I mean. No, I think we've given staff. Yeah, uh, we're not going to file anything on it for 30, 30 days. days. No. Yeah. Right. So we're, we're, I mean, if we're holding off on legal activity for 30 days, why don't we just give them the 30 days? Well, cause because nothing has happened to this point without the foreclosure process being threatened to five be started. Years. And quite frankly, we ha there's other family dollars in the community. There's other family dollars being proposed to the community. And it's not fair to the Gifford community that this has been worked on for five years and there's been absolutely no response or change until magically the foreclosure process started. So I, for one, as the second to the motion and not, am not willing to amend the motion because of that, I feel like the only reason they're here is because this has been threatened. I am, however, willing to allow staff to slow walk it and give them the opportunity to come back in 30 days and say, hey, these are all the changes we've made. This is where we are. My goal is not to foreclose on Family Dollar because it is a vital, important part of the community. It is a resource that they need, but it is a resource they need to be an appropriate condition, just like every other Family Dollar in the community, and not lower level filth and squalor. It's not fair, and the only way, that, the only reason they're here is because this process has started. So. I don't mean that really. I know you guys will probably get it done in 30 days, but that's from my perspective where I am as a seconder to the motion. And if, and if I may, I, I've, I've had the district, I have 11 family dollars from, from Gifford all the way to Stewart. <clears throat> I've been here uh, two years now, and this three weeks ago was the first letter that's ever come into that building pertaining to this. Otherwise, you know, I don't know my processors, and you know, we, this all just came to light. It wasn't like we were ignoring it. As soon as we got that, I sent it to legal. Boom, boom, boom. Here we are. You know, and we're already making progress to get it cleaned up. Um, I just had no idea. You know that. So, that this sir, is outstanding since 2017. Maybe. You know, before just before I get too riled up, I as regional it. manager, as regional manager, and you only have 11 stores. Um, I would think probably at least once a month you're getting around to every store. So in the two years, you've probably made upwards of 20 visits to the store. I can't believe you would walk to that store, see the mess, and not do anything to clean it up. Okay? So I, I'm not buying the whole thing. We didn't know about this. If you're any kind of manager at all, you should have had this cleaned up two years ago. One of the first things you should ever done when you took the job and went to this store and saw how it looked, if it was me, I'd be kicking somebody's butt and making them get it cleaned up that day, okay? So I, I don't mean to get too rough here, but I, 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 the whole thing is we didn't know about this. It, it's a big load of, of you know what to me, okay? So uh, I think, I, I, Mr. I, Fletcher, I you defend, had a comment? I want to defend my staff real quick. I, I don't think that's true. And I can tell you the last time I went by that store was before they cleaned their stuff up. A third of this room full of boxes and garbage in the parking lot. The whole organization should be embarrassed to have a store operated like this. I think it's a, it's a terrible disservice to our Gifford community. I, 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 I urge you to move forward with, with the, with the uh, foreclosure today, authorize staff to slow walk it, but I, I agree with Commissioner Adams' statement. The only reason we're here is, is because we've threatened foreclosure and everything we've done before this, we're gonna pretend didn't happen. And that's the intent of the motion. The intent of the motion is to give greater visual acuity to a very blurred situation. That's all. You need to get moving. You've been here before. Uh, this is my first time before this board. I was yeah. there last week. You, you, the, yeah. And yourself, sir? Uh, never, first ne time. never first time? Okay, so you're going to come back and have it all taken care of. Because I heard something that is so riveting. This was a tremendous disservice to the given community who waited many years to have a store like this available. And as you so stated, uh, that you stayed open uh, and available during COVID times. You know what? Maybe it was a mainstay, but they had to climb over a lot of stuff to get to it. And it's 
not properly done. It was never completed. Five years. Got the notice two weeks ago. I think we can have this all resolved within 30 days so counselor doesn't have to throw the final switch. What do you think? Yes, I completely agree. We're making progress. We just need to get those uh, 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 landscapers in, and that's the final piece. We've reached the one part of the, the puzzle that we're, we believe we're compliant on in terms of the junk and debris and cleaning that part up. Um, the last part of the puzzle is the landscaping, getting those plants in and, and getting those That could be done, though. Community standards. That could be done. That could be done if you need to get with our staff right away because there, we, do, we do need you here. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to speak on this? Yes, ma'am, please come up. Welcome. Your name and address, please. Linda Morgan, 3990 45th Place. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, the Gifford community, uh, that family do dollar, I remember when it first opened, and we were so excited for Mm -hmm. that store to be in our community. It is very convenient for a lot of us, you know, <coughs> even I, I can actually walk to that store from where I'm living right now. Um, we have a lot of elderly people, you know, uh, that can't get around. Maybe they can send some of their loved ones right up the road there to that store. Uh, I this has been dear to me. I have overseen this store and the progress of it uh, since it opened, and for it to just be foreclosed on and closed in our community just like that, that would be that would be a heartbreaking thing for our community. Um, I realize that you know. Many play a part in this. I think the the supervisors, the managers, even the some of the employees all play a part in this. But I don't want to see this store closed. Um, I I just don't want to see it closed. So if you all can make the necessary um, uh, conditions better. That would be good for our community. Uh, uh, this has been ongoing for a while. Um, corporate has been called. Uh, many people have been called regarding this store. So please, please get it in condition and keep it in condition, good condition. I think if the managers and the supervisors were up to par, I think the employees would be up to par as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Anyone else? So we have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams to have staff move forward with the foreclosure process, but to kind of slow walk it until we have an update on April 12th. Is that good yeah. with the motion maker and second? Expect okay. them back. All right, all in favor signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. We'll look forward to seeing you on the 12th. Thank you. Thank okay, you, thank you. And, and if I may just take a moment, Chair. Um, we've never done this before. This is all new for us. And I can say Susan jumped in, was willing to, to do this. Uh, county staff was willing to get involved. This is very brand new. So I just really appreciate Susan jumping in and, and handling these types of issues. So thank you. And you, uh, Chairman, if I, we thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may expound upon that a little bit. Uh, I thank staff for doing it because I have been very vocal in my support of code enforcement and, and, and uh, adding additional personnel because I think once the word gets around that uh, any river, we're not, we're not taking it anymore, you're not going to violate the law, that, that, uh, that we will be a better place for it. And I appreciate the effort that county attorney staff and that Phil staff has, 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 has put on board with all this. And I'm all about using every tool in the box. Thank, thank you very much, Phil Matson, Community Development. And I think they all left for lunch. Oh, there they are. I want to thank them also. Uh, we collected over 60,000 in code fines last week. That's almost a record. So we're bringing some resources to bear to get this additional staff we need. And I really want to thank them for that. It's, it's an aggressive approach and uh, probably needed. Like you say, get the word out. We don't want to be the nanny state, but we really have a very high standard of quality here and we want to keep it. Good. 
Great. Thank you, Phil. Okay, we already did uh, the chapter 164, so moving on to Commissioner Matters. Commissioner Ehrman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to request the board consider the county attorney with the assistance of the Public Works Department to start the process of establishing an MSBU for Pine Tree Park subdivision, and it would be to uh, primarily to improve drainage and, and other future products. Of course, most of you know that Pine Tree Park is, is uh, bordered by 58th Avenue on the east, 66th Avenue on the west, 8th Street and 4th Street on the south, 8th Street on the north, 4th Street on the south. Um, it, it's, an, it's a subdivision that's been there a, a long, long time. Many houses have been built in the future. There's some issues with elevation and drainage that we, that we can't cure uh, due to the new building codes and requirements from the health department. But the, uh, the folks in, in Pine Tree Park and Aaron Sunderland, to be, be, to be credited with his effort, who couldn't be here today, but he had, uh, I explained the process to him of how this is going to work, that this would be just an information gathering type thing, and that we would uh, do the Peter O'Brien mode of, of, of having, uh, you know, town hall meetings and committee meetings to establish and see what the, see if they want to continue on with it, but to get the information first. Um, they do have drainage issues out there, especially in the, in the rainy season that, that don't, uh, don't seem to clear as well. And, and, uh, it looks like the majority so far of the people we've talked to out there are, are wanting to at least move ahead with exploring this establishment of the MSBU. And I'd just like for uh, the commission to uh, direct staff to, uh, explore this area. Second. So that's my motion. I have discussion. Yes, we have a motion by Commissioner Ehrman, second by Commissioner Flesher. Commissioner Adams under discussion. So how does this work for drainage? Are you guys going to figure out what kind of program or plan you're going to put in place? Because we've done road MSBUs, and roads are pretty standard. You know, you're, you're going to grade it, you're going to mill it, you're going to pave it. Drainage improvements could be front swales, they could be rear lot swales, they could be stormwater ponds, they could be ditches and piping, and some of that can be a lot more invasive on people's property than just a road. So is the proposal to come up with options in a drainage plan and then figure out um, how much it's going to cost and how much would be assessed? Or I guess because my fear is, is that we come up with an assessment and move forward and the ultimate plan includes, let's say, rear lot swales, and now we're tearing down trees and in people's backyard, and it's an older subdivision, so there's fences and those types of things, and now they're really upset, even though they wanted it, but they didn't really know what they were getting. So it, what? I guess what's the process for a drainage MSBU to come I up with that? I would defer to the professional, but, but, it, but it, 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 what if they need it? There, there is a lot of drainage behind the houses that's, that's not adequate. Some of the swales uh, you know, need to continue to be clean. Culverts need to be replaced. Uh, things that look, look like that. I, I, just from what I know from the landscape and the photography and, and not living far from that area, it seems like it, it, it could be a, 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 not a super big deal. Uh, with with drainage, but uh, that's you know that's we'll temper that because drainage could become a big deal, but it, it should shouldn't be too big of a deal other than if we have issues behind homes with easements and right of ways. And things Rich, did you want the new water guy to come down oh, and answer this for the, you? The new utilities director come address this. Issue. You know, and it's things water, of that right? nature. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> owner friend. Rich, correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of it has to do with, with the way the subdivision was initially built. Right. You know, a lot of it has to do deal with that, and especially now that some of the other houses, due to septics, are higher. That yeah, that's created some issues. But I think we've resolved most of those by adding swales to sides of houses. It's just a thing that that they've been out there a lot over the years, and it's requiring a lot of our services. And I think that the, what the people in, in uh, Pine Tree Park are willing to do, they're willing to, to be assessed a little more to have some, a little more TLC. I so think. what we, I've been talking to the commissioner about this and I know Pine Tree Park very well. We have been spending a lot of time in there. We're, we've been doing a lot of, a lot of front yard swales. Uh, maintenance hasn't been really our thing over the years, but we're, we're catching up on it. We're, we're really putting a lot of work into all of our subdivisions. Uh, to get the maintenance to where it should be. I'm about five years from getting all that, but we're working on it. 
Pine Tree Park was one of those ones. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in the front yard swales, getting the water to drain down to the canals on 4th Street and 8th Street. Um, in this particular case, a lot of the issues in Pine Tree Park are, as Commissioner Adams said, it's rear yard drainage. There is none. It was never <coughs> constructed. It's kind of like the Highlands. Your rear, rear yard drainage was never constructed. So we're gonna do a big analysis of it. I'm gonna, I've been through there, I know where we're at. We do maintain a small portion of rear, rear yard swales, but it's only in phase one and it's only like five streets. So we're gonna have to look at it. As com the Commissioner Ehrman and I have talked, um, my concerns are there's utilities back there, power poles, there's trees, people use them because it's vegetative buffer from their neighbor. They may not want us in there but we and, and tear it all out to make this work. So it's gonna be a community effort. But first I need to go in and just to analyze it, just like I did with Oslo Park. It's easier with roadways, but drainage is a little bit different, but it's the same philosophy. You go in, you figure out what you need to do, you see if you have support, and then we can run a numbers from there. But until I do that, it's just kinda, of, um, we need to assess it, but this is the first step just like Oslo Park. Okay, so you'll come up with some kind of plan and then figure out how to move it forward. So I guess, Commissioner Ehrman, I'm happy to support this if, if this is something coming from the community. I would just encourage you and or whomever when you have the community meetings to make sure the residents understand that if it does require rear lot swale work and constructing a new rear lot system that was never put in, that's going to that's gonna impact whatever their backyard looks like right now. You know, you, I can say I got used to having a vacant lot behind me and then woke up one morning and I could see, you know, to Broadway and not very happy about that, but not anything I can do. It wasn't my property. I guess I could have bought it and prevented that. But anyway, I say all that to say I can empathize and I, I just, we have to make sure we're telling them because otherwise we're going to be in a situation where we have a bunch of people in the chambers unhappy for something that they thought they wanted and then didn't well it's not my goal to bring them and make them unhappy to you <laughs> no that will be unhappy with you that's but a rest. <laughs> that could be unhappy with me <laughs> and, and rich is right it, a lot of this issue is in the is in the original phase is in the original phase because that ground is flat and there's no there was no pitch or anything like that in any of the lots and things like that so there's some issues so hopefully just by doing an analysis on it, present it to them, and, and Commissioner Adams, we may get to the town meeting, and they may tell them we go pound sand. We don't like the idea. So it's too expensive or it's, or it's too invasive. So we're prepared for that, but I, but I, I think we owe it to these folks to, to at least have, have Rich's staff go through the process, and then we'll take it from there, and I promise I won't have them knocking on your door. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Chair Ehrman, second by Commissioner Flesher. Any other discussion? See you now. All in favor, signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That carries 5 0. That concludes the agenda. It is so. Wait, I have one last thing, really quick. Oh, no, um, no, it's way too I know, I know. Um, the IRL NEP annual reports are out, so I just wanted to make sure I was providing my fellow commissioners with copies of that. I know we've talked about water issues today and rich's favorite infrastructure issues and there's a lot of stuff that is going on in indian river county so just want to make sure everybody got a copy of that so that is all i have and next week i'll be sure to wear my fancy hat for you commissioner i'm expecting that because you failed I miserably failed on valentine's, valentine's day, day. Yeah. okay seeing no other good for the community we are adjourned <laughs>